call together. We have an echo. Jennifer, can you work on that? Everybody in the public, can you please mute your phones? Stand by. asking if we had this uh, lined up. All right, let's see here. I move this here if you guys want me to handle it. All right, we're back now. Some, is somebody like somebody? We're working out this uh, echo here. You guys okay now? All right, there we go. All right. Call the order of the Board of Supervisors meeting May 12th, 9 a.m. Roll call, please. Here. Fernandez? Here. Marcello? Here. Medina? Present. Del Cruz? All right. Pledge of Allegiance led by Supervisor Peter Hernandez, District 3. Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I get a uh, acknowledgement of certificate of posting. So moved to share. Second. Moved by Supervisor Hernandez, second by Botello. Vote. We all, uh, we got a, a, a motion and a second. Can we have a vote, please? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Got it. All right. Four zero. <clears throat> all right. So we're going to go to the uh, clerk of the board for instructions on Zoom and Zoom uh, meetings and participation here momentarily. If you would like to speak on an item, please press star nine or raise your hand. You will have a total of three minutes to speak. And if you could please state your name for the record. Okay. Again, once again, re remember if you're on the phone, star nine, or you can raise your hand to speak. And what we'll do is we'll wait. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit of silence, uh, and it gets a little awkward, but we will wait about 10 or 15 seconds after each uh, item to just to make sure that everybody had the opportunity to speak if they wanted to uh, speak. First item, consent agenda. Any members of the board wish to pull an item off the consent agenda? Any members of the public? Clerk, do we have any members of the public? Yes, we do. On the consent agenda? Yes, we do. Okay, go right ahead. Is it somebody that wants to pull or make a comment? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I hope you can hear me. This yep. is Vedana. Yes, Vedana, do you have a comment on the yes. consent agenda or is this for the regular meeting? Now, on the consent agenda, I just like to remind you guys, in the interest of full transparency, we don't know who's talking when you're talking because you're not on camera, and um, we, we can't tell voices sometimes. And so, if you could remember to announce, or either be on camera or announce so the rest of us can follow. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for that. Any other comments on consent? Okay, bring it back. What's the pleasure of the board? Move to approve. Second. All, aye. All in favor? I, I'm usually waiting for uh, all those yeah, in I'm favor. Just all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, 4 0. Next, we'll go to the regular agenda. And n item number one on the regular agenda, we'll have a presentation from Health and Human Services, Tracy Belton. Good morning, um, this is Tracy Belton from Health and Human Services Agency with a brief report out on the COVID-19 update. So since the last Board of Supervisors meeting, our case count has increased by four. Um, currently, we have one active case. Um, an update on our OptumServe testing site, um, just a reminder that the site is open Sunday through Thursday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. at the Veterans Memorial Building. Um, in order to schedule an appointment, you need to go on their website or call the call center. The information on um, OptumServe is on our website for um, the numbers to call or to, the, to reach the website. Um, during our soft opening from May 5th to May 6th, we tested 137 first responders. 
on average, moving forward, the site has been completing um, approximately 76 tests, and they have the capacity to complete 132 a day. Um, as most of you are aware, the county has transitioned to stage two of the governor's resilience roadmap. Um, we've gradually reopened retail curbside um, and manufacturing and logistics. Um, a reminder for these businesses that it is curbside pickup only, and we encourage the retail businesses to work with the different business associations to develop strategies to solicit their, pro their products and mechanisms to virtually shop and pick up items until we can relax the order more. Um, I'm happy to report that this morning at 834, the county submitted our county variance attestation form um, indicating that we are ready to move forward into the expanded stage two. Um, the form was submitted to CDPH along with our supporting documents. Once CDP, CDPH reviews the document and posts it on their website, it'll allow the, account, the county to expand further into stage two expansion. Um, today, the governor is expected to release guidance today on how to expand into that ex expansion. And so we look forward to that and we will be updating our website with the guidance and referring to the governor's guidance as well. Um, the county in partnership with United Way Area on Aging, Area Agency on Aging, County Express, and as well as our local restaurants, we will be providing meals to qualified seniors, three meals a day. Uh, we're continuing to roll out that plan. We don't have a start date yet, but we are working diligently on rolling this out for our seniors in the community. And that's it for my report. Um, Dr. David Gilarducci, our interim public health officer, is also on the line if the board has any questions for him to answer. Anybody uh, from the board, Mr. Medina? Yes, uh, good morning. Well, this is Mark Medina. Uh, doctor, th the only question I really have is I've received a lot of uh, phone calls, both for and against the masks. I personally agree with uh, the mask ordinance, but uh, I've noticed in the last week or so, there are, have been other counties that are relaxing the ordinance. Riverside comes to mind. Just wanted to uh, get your input on that and trying to figure out why these other counties are relaxing their uh, ordinance. Would you be able to educate me on that, please? Uh, good morning, yes, and thank you for that question. So when it came to the question of uh, facial coverings for the public, uh, we felt pretty strongly that as we, um, as we open up again, as we start to relax some of the restrictions as far as stay at home, and we're now uh, looking into expanded stage two, which includes a lot more interaction between people, it seemed contradictory to then relax the facial covering order, which actually will increase the risk of transmission. So I think the last thing any of us wanna do is to fall backward and get into a more restrictive situation again. All of the uh, kind of uh, pain that we have gone through in the last couple of months uh, would be for naught if we just allowed um, uh, sort of easy transmission between persons. I can't say exactly why each county that has relaxed this restriction has done so, but I suspect that uh, there's also similar political pressures elsewhere that may have driven those questions, those um, those decisions. But from from a, a purely disease control perspective, the uh, facial coverings are uh, an important social um, uh, tool that will help us limit the spread of disease, especially as we um, take on more activities that are risky. Thank you for your explanation, sir. Supervisor Hernandez. <clears throat> I don't know if uh, Supervisor Botello wanted to share some comments. Mine are actually a little bit broader, so I wanted to, uh, you know, to a certain extent, it's it's outside of the. I, I can I can share if you want. I could let Supervisor, Supervisor Botello go right ahead. Oh, okay, I, I'm sure uh, Supervisor Hernandez and I have have a lot to update the board and and the public as far as our work. The last couple of weeks, we've been meeting every day, uh, hosting the business community and, and, and interested public on uh, different workshops uh, to try to reopen the roadmap to recovery ad hoc committee and the, 
the uh, work has been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Duce Alfonso, our management analyst, and Edgar Rosco and uh, Tracy Bell, uh, and EDC and Chamber of Commerce has done phenomenal work uh, getting this put together. We've had good participation, over 50, 60 people during the workshops, which I think that's been outstanding. And, um, but, you know, one of the comments that, um, the question that Supervisor Medina asked was, is very relevant as far as uh, bringing awareness to the fact that our county, we can't take a step backwards as far as the infection rate. And it, it's easy to say we should be doing what these other counties are doing. As uh, Tracy, she, she was pretty modest, I think, as far as getting that variance out to the governor uh, this morning. I mean, early morning. And uh, we're uh, moving forward to try to get uh, into stage two and through stage two. We can't get to stage three until we finish stage two. And uh, we're well on our way. But the fact of the matter is, we were probably one infection away from not being able to submit that paperwork in that variance. P the public needs to know that. And the public needs to help us in, um, comply with these these guidances that we're having uh, demonstrated through our workshops um, and and the or, uh, orders that have come down from the state and and uh, the cooperation that we've had up to this point has been enabling us to move our county to the point where we could open our, our businesses and uh, so we really need to have that word out and I know there uh, we've all been taking some phone calls that we should do this and look at these other counties that are resisting the governor that's not something that we should be doing here uh, what we need to uh, continue is keep in mind our health um, and support of our businesses uh, will benefit from it so uh, I, I really want to thank all of the, everybody that has participated in the five workshops that we've had so far. We're, we have at least five or six more to go, um, and um, or, or you know we're we're continuing to work hard to bring our county back. Do you have any specific questions for the doctor, real quick, in case he needs to jump off the line? I'm not sure. Um, uh, anything for him specifically? Then we'll finish the presentation with not Tracy. Uh, Yes, I do. I, I'm sorry. Yes, I do. Uh, doctor, if everything goes right with this, our application for a vari uh, county variance, how long do you think that we'll be locked into the stage two before we can move to stage three? Is there any idea uh, from your perspective? Uh, doc yeah, uh, thank you for that question, and thank you for your comments regarding the importance of uh, facial coverings. Um, you know, the uh, I can't give you a timeline. I think it really depends on what happens, um, how uh, the disease spreads. Obviously, we're very concerned about a boomerang uh, in the fall. Um, prior pandemics um, have shown a similar pattern, so we're going to be carefully watching for that. Um, but uh, I think that it's gonna take a while to know uh, what the effect of stage two will be, especially for those counties like ours that are, are applying for variants. Um, they, uh, I, I believe the state's gonna kind of go to school on us here and they're gonna see what happens to our case rates and our hospitalizations. And that's going to inform when, um, when stage three is gonna be even an option for counties. So to, to answer your question, I don't know when. Uh, I think we're still a ways off Ultimately, I don't think we're gonna get back to normal until we have a vaccine available and we're able to control uh, the disease in that respect. So um, we're gonna see probably adjustments all along the way, but it's not gonna be back to the way it was, um, say, you know, last November uh, for quite some time. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead, uh, back to Supervisor Mark Medina. Sorry about that, but you said a statement that I want to make sure we're clear on. Normal 
and vaccine. Now, when you're saying a vaccine, vaccine, as I understand, would not be available for possibly six months to a year. So when you're months, actually is what they're saying. What is the vaccine? Wh what do you? What is the time of the vaccine will be available? Do you think, sir? You know, uh, I, in in normal times, the vaccine takes about four to five years to develop, and there's uh, some aspects that really can't be rushed. But my understanding is this vaccine development is um, is probably going to go a lot faster. Um, I think Dr. Fauci has estimated um, 18 months uh, from the start of this, so maybe 15 months from now, but it could be as early as a year. Uh, I do uh, want to point out, though, that uh, we have had um, various coronaviruses. The coronavirus ca also causes uh, different versions of it, cause the common cold, and we haven't had a cure for that yet. So uh, I'm hopeful that a vaccine can be developed. I don't think it'll be less than a year from now. But without a vaccine, we will still be able to go out in public and be able to uh, sit down at a restaurant and do things that we've done in the past. Is, is, that, cor is that a correct assumption? I think uh, you will see us gradually get back to way the, the life used to be, uh, but I think there will always be some, uh, until we have a vaccine, there will be some differences. And that'll, you know, as far as restaurants go, it'll probably be things like uh, more spacing between tables. Um, you'll probably see your server wearing a mask. Um, there'll be other controls in place that may not be as uh, evident. Thank you for the clarification, sir. I had a question, Supervisor. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez, you have a specific yeah. question? Doctor, yeah, I had a specific question, Doctor. So what uh, Supervisor Vitello and Medina were alluding to basically references, which I think is the bigger question, is what is the formula? And I'm hearing it's one per 10,000, and it's within 14 days. So if the audience can capture that math, it's almost impossible to meet even for larger counties, especially for larger counties. I mean, as a small county, the burden that it's putting on us is already really heavy because the moment, and, and here's the thing, um, and it's what I've spoken about before. So, so well, let me, let me uh, premise it with this. I have full respect for you, doctor. Uh, my goal is ultimately, I know I understand that, that your, your directions come from the state in that sense. Uh, so you're, this is not directed towards you. It's the overall state mindset. It's, it's, it feels like it's literally, uh, let's make it up as we go. Let's come up with a formula and let's have it make sense at least to, to, to the general public enough so that we don't um, figure out how to address it. And I'm not saying that that's intentional, I don't know, but it doesn't matter. It just seems, to me it just seems outrageous to ask for, for us to have less than six cases within 14 days. We're almost intentionally trying to not open up. And I don't understand what that math premises on um, so, so I just, I feel like, so that's my question is why, what is that math and how can, how can we justify um, one out of every 10,000 people within 14 days, uh, doctor, if you can answer that question, I'd appreciate it. Well, I think the, uh, I mean, as far as the, the numbers themselves and how they were chosen, I, I can't speak to that, but I can tell you the intent is to uh, have a, an objective means of measuring the rate of spread, uh, the prevalence of disease, and the ability of the healthcare system to respond to it. And so uh, I, think, I think the state orders make sense from that perspective that um, it provides benchmarks for uh, counties to meet and to shoot for. And so if it means building testing capacity or it means contact tracer or, or it means that the hospital so builds surge capacity, I think those are all positive things. I, the overall objective is to um, have a situation where our, the rate of spread uh, exceeds the ability of our healthcare system to handle these cases. That means that many more people will die from this, not just from COVID, but people will die from heart attacks and gunshot wounds and every other thing that we have to deal with in our healthcare system are all going to be crowded out by COVID cases. And so the intent of this is to have, have uh, benchmarks in place that help um, to prevent that from happening. Go ahead, Supervisor. Yeah, so as a follow-up, so what I'm hearing is, is our capacity is six people, 
that's it, which means no more than six people in the hospital can be handled. And, and I mean, you, you mentioned doctors, and I, I, I see Supervisor Gillo sh shaking his head, but it, so are we predicting that we're gonna have tons of strokes and heart attacks and all these other things that are gonna cr crowd out the six, six uh, COVID cases? Like, I mean, what about flu? What about, you know, what about others? I mean, there's a litany of things. So, so where is the math that we're saying six cases, that's it, COVID, no more than that, otherwise we shut down our community again? So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna well, fill in for uh, Doctor. Excuse me one second. For, I'm, I'm thinking Tracy could perhaps answer that. And the only reason I'm jumping in a little bit is I was on a call with CDPH and uh, the doctor and um, uh, the, our health department on Monday. And I, I think it would be helpful after um, Supervisor uh, Botello needs to make a comment to the doctor. Maybe Tracy, if you could finish your presentation and go into what the uh, Phase Two B qualifications were. Thirty-five percent surge capacity at the hospital. Um, Y yes, you're correct, Supervisor Hernandez, that the, the limit they're saying is six to get into 2B, but if you have seven, you don't have to immediately come out of 2B. There's a lot more to it, so I think it'd be really important to hear hear that from um, our, our public health director or our CAO. And did you want to make a comment now, or would you rather hear the presentation, Supervisor Patello? Yeah, I, I just wanted, before Supervisor the doctor Patello has speaking to, now. Go thank ahead. you. Before the doctor has to jump uh, and go back to work, uh, thank him for you know the ex outstanding work that you worked with the health department the hospital in getting that variance application out uh, this morning that was work that was done all week uh, all weekend long and uh, you played a huge role in I advancing uh, uh, th th that to the state and I really really appreciate it and uh, so I'll leave it at that I just want to express my gratitude for for a job well done. And I had another question, Supervisor. Uh, is it a specific question for the doctor or yeah. about the process? Because yeah. I want Tracy to go over the process for all of us. Okay, and, and maybe it'll answer it, but nonetheless, it's a question that she could meditate on and hopefully have an answer. Um, so so w when it came down to the there all these different criteria, one of the ones that really stands out is now we're, the state is pushing for increased testing, which makes sense, right? You want to know how many more people. But by default, right, doesn't matter the severity, if you think about it, at completely absent of severity, the moment we start finding out how many more cases, mm -hmm. we're, we're in a position pretty much to go way over. So if that's the case, uh, is it more presumptive of, of what the risk is or is it more presumptive of just math? Because risk to me says, hey, if you got a cold and you feel fine, stay home, you're okay. But if we're saying no, we're saying that anybody who's basically uh, uh, sick, we're already assuming, right, which the math already shows 95% of folks recover. Uh, and, and it, it, you know, it was once said 80% are asymptomatic, which basically means they have very little symptoms, and that was the fear of the spread. So if, uh, now I'm hearing it's closer to, to that 95, which makes me wonder to what extent and the severity in the grand majority of healthy folks that uh, <coughs> there's, there's not this severity for the majority of the population, right? There is that sensitive population. So again, it poses the question, is it really about risk or is it about math? So that's my question. Okay, thank you. Um, Tracy, can you continue with the presentation and specifically, if you don't mind, could you get into, uh, or Ray, if, if whoever's more comfortable, whichever one on your team is, wh what it took to get into to be, what the requirements are and, and what, um, what we can look forward to uh, changing in 2B as far as perhaps dine-in restaurants and, and those sorts of things. And I know there's more guidance coming, but it just in general, uh, thank you. Oh, Mr. Chair, if I may, I, I'd like to go ahead and start off and then I'll have Tracy go ahead and elaborate a little further. So sure, go ahead, CAO, CAO Espinosa speaking now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as, um, as everyone's aware, we received a, um, a variance to stage two of California roadmap to modify the stay at home order and basically it's an attestation form that uh, counties have the ability to, um, to fill out if they qualify. So that was received on Friday. That's when we received this, so everyone's aware of it. And um, with that, um, there's obviously some um, questions and some things that we need to address within this form. So in order to qualify or at least submit uh, to the state, so with that, um, there's some benchmarks. Um, I think Supervisor Peter Hernandez had just mentioned 
no more than one COVID case per 10,000 in the past 14 days to attest to attestation uh, submission date. So to elaborate a little bit further on that, we are using a number of about 62,000 residents within our community. So we have the ability to um, have 6.2 or less um, to qualify for that. And um, we did meet that criteria. Um, so let's say tomorrow we get three more cases now or um, four more cases. Does that mean, or let's just say maybe in two or three days, um, that occurs. The businesses have already opened. And once, and just for clarity as well, once this form is submitted and reviewed by the state um, and the uh, uh, folks that are um, reviewing it is Jake, and I believe her name is uh, Carolyn Kirst, is um, when they review it, they upload it. Once it's uploaded on the state's website, at that point, the we can then move to stage 2B, so to speak, or the entire stage two, which means um, businesses can move, can actually start their businesses that fall in that B category. So with that though, let's say they open up, they start doing business and we have four more cases, we go over the 6.2. The state's not saying that we have to shut down at that point. We're gonna continue, we just need to continue to monitor and make sure that we're doing everything in our power um, that we're being, that we're adhering or the businesses are adhering and the county is adhering to, the, to a safety or a safe environment. And that's what we're doing with town hall meetings, we're meeting uh, both uh, Peter Hernandez, Supervisor Hernandez and Supervisor Botello and staff has been meeting regularly to make sure and emphasize that point to the business community. Um, and there's another, another one as well um, with regards to um, testing capacity. Um, there is a, a minimum daily testing uh, volume of 1.4 um, to 1,000 residents. And um, there's also other, um, sorry, my glasses are fogging up, so bear with me here. Um, containment capacity also is a requirement um, that we have to uh, um, adhere to. So um, there has to be for counties that, that have no, more, no cases that there be at least 15 staff per 100,000 county um, population, which we adhere to. So we qualify for that. So as, as you go through this, there's 12 pages. There's 12 pages uh, of this. In addition to that, there's also homeless, um, addressing homelessness and to make sure that we have the capacity to address that. And, uh, and if there's any uh, COVID cases, what is our containment value? And we're able to manage that. Um, the hospital capacity as well, the PPE requirement. So there's, a, there's a numerous items um, that we had to adhere to. I think your board has taken the initiative, the very onset of this, when we met with the joint cities, your board actually allocated $1 million to start going after PPE. And I can tell you it was difficult, but we actually were able to acquire quite a bit of PPE, which I think is really advantageous for us because there's been a lot of counties that haven't been able to do that or it's cost them a great deal of money. So I think um, you know, with our county and the leadership of your board, we've been very um, on point and we're able to answer yes, basically, to every single one of these uh, questions the state's put out. Um, so, you know, it has been, uh, you know, I, I'm gonna also thank staff Tracy and her team. Uh, they've been doing a, a great job working over the weekend and working odd hours. Um, I can tell you, been on the phone with them and they, they've been working very hard to get this done as well as coordinating with our doctor. So, um, I, you know, I think with that, um, you know, I wanted to make sure that you knew that there were some requirements. There's also another couple of requirements I think is appropriate to ask of you now. It's found for us on page 11 within the attestation form. And there's a, a letter of support from the local hospitals um, in the event that the county does not have a hospital or healthcare system. There's, you know, either a healthcare um, system um, like we have. Um, you know, small healthcare systems for smaller counties. Uh, so they needed to require a letter of support for this to make sure that they can adhere to um, the, the requirements within this form. Another one is also support from your board of supervisors. We, we, have given, we have had plenty of direction from your board, and I just wanna codify this, that um, 
over the board meetings that we've had, we've had uh, your board request us uh, to put support letters and supporting us for um, finding more funding through our uh, legislatures as well as um, for support to um, to really kind of move forward through stage two. But I wanted to ask your board to please, you know, codify this. I know that there's also another letter on the, on the agenda as well in here, but I just want to make sure for a formality that you guys do that. So with that, I, I'll pass it on to Tracy. And Tracy, I don't know if you want to elaborate any further on... on um, I had a question, CAO Espinosa. <coughs> Let me have Tracy finish, Peter, and then we'll, we'll ask questions at the uh, end of the presentation. Well, I just want to make sure we don't lose our thought because it was reference to what he said, and, and after she says a whole lot, it, we might lose it really quick. So, If it's a quick question, go right ahead, and then we'll have yeah. her continue. Yeah, it's just, it, it basically had to do with what you mentioned, CAO Espinosa, is, is you said, okay, if, if after the f uh, 14 days we open up because we did our good job, and uh, all of a sudden we get four cases. You said that, you know, basically what you mentioned was it we reset to zero. But that assumes that within the next 14 days we don't have six cases. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, we're on the bubble after that with two more, if we hit, hit four cases and then there's two more cases basically that's going to put us in a position or jeopardy to shut so down again. So uh, thank you for the comment. I think it's a, a very valid comment. So what it is is a, is a picture of a point in time. So in order for us to submit this, we had to be at a point in time, everything, we're good with every single one of these items. One of the conversations that we've had, I think, um, I think Supervisor Gilio uh, had some conversations with the state as well, is that, you know, as we move forward and we add more capacity for testing, what's gonna happen? Tests are gonna increase. Just yeah, more statistically, it's gonna happen. So, so with that, you know, how, how are we going to address that if that's the case? And so basically that was one of the questions that we had with the state. And the state said, you know, it's, a, it's basically a picture in time. Where are you at today? And so today we, we hit those numbers. We, we were, were valid to submit this. We were able to submit this because we meet the criteria in this. Tomorrow it may be different. We may be a little bit higher because we are testing much more. I think the two weeks, I, Tracy can probably correct me if I'm wrong, I remember hearing that we were having about 20, 30 tests done before we had the new testing center at the Vets Hall. Now we're getting close, if not over 100 now. So the, the tests are just gonna continue to ramp up. And with that, you know, statistically, you're gonna probably be seeing more numbers come in that are, you know, COVID numbers. But with that, they just, th this was just a kind of a picture in time. So what does that mean? We're through stage two is what it means. If the board, if uh, everything goes well, they post it. Um, what does it mean for stage three? Most likely, there'll probably be another one for stage three with other matrix, other data, other requirements that we probably have to follow. Well, I don't know that, but that's what it sounds like um, in my conversation I had Monday that there was some kind of leaning to, to you know, the next, the next phase, the next, the next part of this process. So, CEO, can we go to Tracy and to yes, finish up the presentation yep. just so we can get all the different facts on our yeah. attestation form? Thank you. Tracy, if you're there on Zoom, Tracy Belton, uh, Director of Health and Human Services. I, I'm actually finished my presentation. I don't know, uh, Ray pretty much covered everything that we discussed in our attestation form. Um, it is 12 pages long, as he indicated. There are several indicators that, that we had to address, and we feel right now that we are in a good place. And so, um, you know, we will continue to assess, assess these on a regular basis with the doctor. In the event that our case count increases, we will have to assess them as they go, and that's the expectation of CH, CVPH for us to do. And so it's just an ongoing assessment, just like it has through the whole process. And so um, I don't know if there's any other questions about the attestation form, but once it's a, um, posted on the website, everybody will be able to take advantage of looking at it and looking at all the supporting documents that we provided to the state um, to say that we're ready to move into stage two, the expansion. Yeah, so one thing that I, I, I heard from the presentation that we, we went to, uh, I think it was, uh, was it Monday, mm -hmm. yesterday? Man, the days are melding <laughs> together quickly. Uh, with CDPH was that we had to wait for this to be posted publicly. I think you specifically asked that question. And so we're gonna need to get the uh, letter from the Board of Supervisors, which we hope to perhaps have today. And then uh, the uh, attestation form, uh, the 12-page document needs to be posted online for the public to be able to scrutinize, and then we can move into phase 2B. One of the things that you mentioned, um, 
Tracy and perhaps a doctor as well was um, that there is still guidance we're waiting for to, to hear from the state regarding uh, phase 2B. Can you tell us what um, what you know about that or the if, if phase 2B is the wrong term or the advanced phase 2, the second part of phase 2, can you tell us what you know about that and what, what our community can expect to um, have loosened up and be able to do? And one of the things that I heard from the CDPH call was that we were uh, one of the uh, very few counties that um, are are able to do this based on you know 100% contact tracing, our testing, our 35% surge capacity in the hospital, our PPE supplies. So we're, there's not a whole lot of counties that are able to get into this advanced phase. Can you let our community know what that may mean, even if you don't know exactly yet? What, what do we know so far? I can tell you what we what's been posted online, and that that's really all we know is that um, they're going to relax retail restrictions, um, adapt and reopen schools, child care facilities, offices with limited um, base offices to to try to telework if possible, um, and some limited hospitality and per, per, personal services. I think they specifically listed uh, dog grooming. <clears throat> um, car washes, tanning salons, there were some specific ones listed. I don't have them all pulled up here, but I, I'm hopeful that today we will have more guidance. And, and just, you know, for the record, we did submit everything that was required of us um, this morning at 834. Um, I submitted the letter from the board, um, the letter from the hospital, all our supporting documents and our attestation variant form signed by our doctor. And so the next step is waiting for confirmation from CDPH and the information from the governor today, and then we will be working diligently to get um, information out to the businesses that are able to reopen um, with some guidance. And so we're hopeful. There's also some outdoor restaurant dining that they are expected to allow. So I know that's something that we all look forward to as well. Okay, thank you. We look forward to that guidance. CAO Espinosa had his hand up. Do you have a question there? No, you're good? Okay. No, I was just agreeing with that. Okay, uh, with, uh, with that, I think we should take uh, public comment. Um, Jennifer, do you have anybody with their hands raised? And remember for public comment, if you want to raise your hand, raise your hand. If you're on the phone, you're gonna hit star nine and you'll have exactly uh, three minutes. And after uh, three minutes is up, we'll move on to the uh, next uh, speaker. Jennifer. Um, if you could please time. remember to state your name for the record. Sometimes I'll call this after. Hunter. Which is, I'll bring it back. Hunter Cuneo. Uh, first, I want to point out, and this is something that some of my clients insisted I mention today, that when I speak, as I have in the past few weeks at these meetings, I'm speaking as a representative of San Benito Strength. We've made our own committee, and I speak on its behalf. It's comprised of farmers and growers, realtors, educators and teachers, engineers, tech workers, restaurant owners and food suppliers, pilots, contractors and tradesmen, doctors and healthcare workers, and multiple law enforcement officers. So this is a broader, more diverse representation of people and their families in this county than any committee or council I've seen set up by our local government. And what we are calling for from the members of our community is freedom and peaceful defiance of these unjust decrees, not in phases, but freedom right now. I wanna address the orders sent out by our Health and Human Services from about 10 days ago, specifically the can't do list we were given as if we are a bunch of children. It states that we can't invite friends or family to our home for dinner. We can't go for a drive unless we are headed to an immediate destination for food or medicine. Then following this one was the guidance for faith-based organization. This one offers an allowance for drive up religious services where vehicles must be parked six feet apart and windows must be kept closed. It states that if necessary, a window may be cracked a quarter of the way down. Is there logic or science that supports rolling windows down a quarter of the way rather than a third of the way down? If so, I'd like to hear it. Or is this just the work of busybody nanny state bureaucrats who are insulated from the consequences of their orders and actions? Because last I checked, none of our local officials have forfeited their paychecks that are funded by the same taxpaying businesses and property owners that they are crushing. Whoever drafted these orders or helped draft them should be ashamed of themselves and should never be treated as serious people again. Orders and decrees like this have no place in a free society. I want to remind everybody that in all of our history, including our world wars, civil war, the pandemic of 1918, never has the public practice of religion been outlawed or regulated until now. And those of you holding office at any level are going along with this, and the governor's orders will have to accept that you were complicit 
in this unprecedented assault on our religious freedom and our constitutional rights. I believe that most of you see this totalitarianism but lack the courage to call it that or resist it. And you'll have to own this as part of your legacy. My committee's even preparing to run pro-freedom and anti-lockdown candidates for local office in upcoming elections. But for now, to any freedom-loving members of the public listening right now, we are going to have to bypass our local government and begin taking back our rights ourselves. The best part is that we don't even have to fight to do this. All we have to do is simply and peacefully go back to living our lives. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Catherine, if you could please state your name for the record. Hello. Hi, my name is Catherine Wallace. I am the owner of Cat Flash Studio, and I am speaking on behalf of the beauty industry here in San Benito County. First, we want to just thank you for hearing our voices. We value our careers and guest relationships, which is why we have come together as a team, a community, to create and deliver a more safe and sanitary environment for all. We believe the beauty industry maintains high health standards and abides by all sanitation regulations provided by the California Bard Board of Barbering and Cosmetology. We have all completed an immense amount of hours of schooling and had to pass two state board exams in order to become a licensed professional with the California Board of Barbering and Cosmetology. Sanitation and disinfection procedures are always a top priority within our industry and we firmly believe in continuous education. We have all completed a course and received a COVID-19 barbicide certification. Barbicide is a chemical used to properly sanitize and disinfect our implements and other non-porous surfaces. This hospital grade chemical is registered by the United States Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. It's also germicidal. I'm so sorry, I'm probably gonna butcher these words. Um, some, um, somicidal, fungicidal, and vericidal, and I apologize, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> um, it destroys harmful microorganisms, pathogenic bacteria, and is even effective against hepatitis C, hepatitis C, and HIV. We understand social distancing may be challenging for us, which is why we have added additional infection control standards to our businesses and services. Here are solutions we have collaborated and will be implementing within our establishments. Signage will be posted in each business stating new standards and protection plans surrounding COVID-19. No services will be provided for guests who have been exposed or who are experiencing COVID-19 symptoms. We will be reaching out personally to our guests 24 hours prior to their appointment. A clean face mask is required for all upon entering business. Professionals will be wearing a clean or disposable mask for each service. Hand sanitizer will be required and available upon entering and exiting business and if needed throughout service. If mandated, all guests will have their temperature checked by a sanitized forehead before engaging in appointment. Avoid as much direct contact. We will not be handshaking, hugging, or high fives. No lobby waiting. Guests are to remain in vehicle until notified by professional that their service is ready. No walk-ins. You must have a scheduled appointment and it will be recorded for easy tracking. We will be adding 15 minutes to the end of each service to ensure appropriate time is allotted for sanitizing. No visitors will be allowed. Minors and individuals with disabilities are the only people to have a chaperone on specified okay. business days. Thank you very After much. Each Next speaker, please. Courtney. If you could please state your name for the record. Hi there, my name is Courtney Evans and I'm owner of Kamal Yoga Studio. I first have to say that I'm extremely disappointed with the um, compliance of our elected representatives. Um, to the public health officer and public health director, um, there is no appeal process to your decisions. There's no selection criteria and this is unlawful. You've mandated my business closed uh, under the term emergency. There's zero probable cause for that. This is day number 58. My business provides an undaunting list of effects for your immune system. It boosts the immune system, system function, flexibility, muscle strength. It drains your lymph and boosts your immunity, drops your blood pressure. I can go on and on with the benefits of my business. 
The role of the health department is to provide a safeguard and promote health, not regurgitate the governor's rhetoric. I refuse to comply. I refuse. I will stand up. I will not require masks. They hinder and prevent the, the breath to flow naturally. I refuse a vaccine. I refuse to sit and wait for orders from people that are the paid government employees. I ask that our representatives stand up and someone have a voice for our freedom. It states that the civil and human rights, my rights require that the state redress, remedy and set right any discriminating law, practice or policy that discriminates against me to enjoy my health, to be happy, enjoy my health without discrimination. Your threat that I need to have a vaccine before my life goes to normal is ridiculous. I refuse. I stand proud that I will stand for my rights. My business will be open. People can give hugs. My business is for the willing. My business supports health, happiness, and connections between people. Shame on our representatives. I am disgusted and I'm also absolutely disgusted with this government funded program, our health department at this moment. Thank you, next speaker, please. David, if you could please. Hello, this is Patrick. Yes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm not surprised, but I am disappointed. Uh, per the report yesterday, we have 1,195 tested, 56 cases confirmed, and one case remaining active. Two deaths were well over a month ago, and we're due to core mobili mor morbidities. Uh, uh, yet our elect unelected health officer continues to mandate unconstitutional actions upon our citizens and businesses. We were told to flatten the curve. The curve isn't flat, it's gone. And the goalpost continues to move further back. Not to say that COVID-19 is gone, it will likely be around for years. As many viruses are, a vaccine is not the answer. We cannot continue with this unreasonable lockdown. It isn't warranted, it never was. Making us wear a mask has no effect other than to show submission to these unconstitutional edicts from an unelected person make sick people and those vulnerable quarantine and wear masks. That is reasonable. This broad house arrest is an indicator of how inept our local officials are and our health department as well. Weeks ago, I stated the health officer needs to lose the tunnel vision and look at the situation in a different lens. We instead got a useless mask edict. Our deaths per 100,000 in this county is about three. It is ridiculous to keep all healthy, young and able bodies under house arrest wearing useless masks in the and destroying our local businesses. Last year, the top 10 deaths was contributed to was 73.8% of all deaths. Heart disease was 165 per 100,000, Alzheimer's 31 per 100,000, flu and pneumonia 14.3 per 100,000, suicide 14, that's probably gonna go up. We have three deaths per 100,000. It's not even come close to an emergency. Herd immunity is our only way out of this. Vaccines aren't fail-proof. Our local so-called leaders continue to fail us miserably. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Michelle, if you could please state your name. Michelle. Michelle, perhaps you're muted. Uh, can you hear us, Michelle? Why don't we keep Michelle on, in line and then let's go on to the next speaker. Robert, if you could please state your name. Uh, Robert Bernoski. So first of all, I just wanna say uh, again, thank you so much to the Board of Supervisors for having these special meetings and willing to listen to um, the public. Um, I, I just want to point out that the impact of your actions 
are much bigger than any other issue that I've ever experienced in San Benito County. And I've lived here 25 years and been going to your meetings for, um, you know, at least 10 or 15 of those years. But, um, and I bring that up because I come home at night and I tell my wife, yeah, I participated in the county supervisor meeting. And she said, I know I was listening too. My wife does not participate in local politics except in her role um, as an as a educator. But the things that you are doing are so important. Even people that are normally um, not as involved are now involved. So I just want you to have that as a frame of reference. And um, I, I want to remind you that although not nefariously, your actions are literally taking away livelihoods, as you've heard in the public comments here, but just step back and think about what you are doing. And it is taking an emotional toll on many. As you know, I am involved in the education process to some degree, and I have to tell you, what we are taking away from the children and their parents, it's huge. And um, uh, on a mental health basis, I am truly worried about it. So anyway, the problem, um, with, with that I have and people of like mine um, is with the government actions thus far is though it, there's nonsensical stuff going on. Like it's okay to continue to build a government project with its union labor, like the school that the Hollister School Business is building. Yet my friends who are in the trades, they're not allowed to build a home for me or do a remodel or even paint um, a house for me. I, mean, I, I know that that's open now, perhaps, but it hasn't been because of the actions that you and the other government officials have uh, taken. So and, and I want to leave you with this, and it's with all due respect. I know all the Board of Supervisors and, and many others, and uh, I, I cherish the relationships that we have and the, uh, the back and forth we can have. But um, it is with due respect that I, I pose the following question. Are you aware of any public official that has suffered financially from the loss of salary or benefits from their official positions as a result of their actions. Because I can think of none. And I, I just ponder, if, if that were the case, and if the governor and his bureaucracy and all of his- Your next speaker, please. If you could please state your name. Al? Yes, 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 yes
Good morning. My name is Jackie Morris Lopez, and I'm representing myself. I'm a resident of San Juan Batista, District 2. Um, it's not very often I agree with my supervisor, but I want to commend uh, Supervisor DiPello today. Um, I feel like you are upholding the common sense here of following the governor's guidelines to protect your community, hence your district and our county. I also am a healthcare professional. I'm a physician assistant, Stanford trained. I just recently disturbed, like at this meeting, a very disturbing text from my coworker, that a patient I saw on Friday who presented to my clinic perfectly well, minimal symptoms, tested positive. I just got the text just a few minutes ago. So what I'm trying to say, and I wasn't going to mention this, I'm not breaking HIPAA, but you need those business people that spoke previously in Hollister, my neighbors to the east. You need to realize that this is not a hoax. This is not something that's robbing you of your constitutional rights to freedom of speech, freedom to earn a living, freedom of happiness, freedom to run in your yard naked or do hot yoga. I'm being serious about this. This is a real thing. Friday, this patient appeared well, no temperature. The reality is this is a pandemic. I commend the supervisors that are willing to uphold the current mandates and phase opening. Masks are to protect you from me and me from you. This virus is very contagious and now there is a new epidemic starting. Let the test roll out. We started testing Sunday. Myself and my husband are taking the test this evening. I as a healthcare provider and he has someone over 60. I think the community has the right, those of us that err on the side of science, science is part of my profession, hearsay, gossip, frustration about livelihoods, we're all suffering. I'm working one day a week. I'm willing to sacrifice for the health and welfare of my community at large, my neighbors, my family, you, your families, everybody here. Patience, please, folks. Two weeks of testing will give the public health department and the state the data that they need in our rural county. Be grateful and thankful that our county was chosen to receive an abundance of testing. My other comment is that I hope that there's outreach being done to the affected communities that are at risk, our homeless people, our senior citizens, our farm workers in the community, our non-English speaking residents. Anyone that wants the test should get it it's online, it's free if you can't afford it. I believe it is free, correct me, public health staff, if you're there listening. Um, it's an appointment, get online. I think there needs to be more Thank you, outreach. Ma Next speaker, please. Terrio, if you could please state your name. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Okay, uh, I'm Dr. Hurtado, I'm an actual physician. I live here in the county, I'm trained as a physician, been in medicine for 20 years. That includes graduate level courses in public health, virology, molecular biology, and all that. And um, I, last time I talked to you guys about science and hysteria, I think that when you understand science, it's not as scary as it should be. At the beginning, our public health officials decided to flatten the curve, which is the correct response. We did that initially until we found out a little bit more information. We did a great job. Our hospitals are now under capacity. We have to stop and think, this is mother nature, this is a virus. It's a seasonal cold, believe it or not, even though the media has blown it up, it is part of the cold family, thus it acts like a seasonal cold and flu, which means in the summer, it's going to go away, it's gonna come back in the fall. Right now is actually the best time to loosen restrictions. The UV light, the ventilation, being outside is gonna kill the virus, it's gonna be gone just like it is every year. Right now is when we need to be working to build up our reserves, both financially, emotionally, physically, to be ready for the next phase of this coming up in the fall. Um, our goal has never been zero infections. This is mother nature, you can't avoid that. People are old, people die. I'm not saying that lightly, I'm a physician. I've had people die in front of me. I talk to families about dying, but it is a natural part of being a human being that you will be born and you will die when you get old. Uh, of course, when you're older, you're gonna have more susceptibility, that's life. That's not, that's actually, that's not even medical. It's not, I didn't learn that in medical school, I learned that in life. 
Our goal is to build herd immunity. We should be doing that. You're not doing that if everybody is locked inside. This is not as bad as other illnesses in that the young do not suffer like those that are older and have comorbidities. The young should be out building that herd immunity. That should be our goal. You need to take advantage of this summertime right now for that reason. Waiting for a vaccine is not a strategy. Vaccine takes years to develop safely. What if it doesn't work? How many, year, how many times do people get the flu vaccine and then they still get the flu? Additionally, um, the vaccine itself, what are you trying to do? You're actually trying to build herd immunity. Let's do it naturally. Let's avoid the loss of constitutional rights. Let's, let's not face this where um, the authorities in charge are getting respect, the loss of uh, community respect and guidelines. I want you to remember that quarantine is for those that are at risk. That's been a basic public health principle. The disease does not affect the young, like I said before. Let's build herd immunity. Let's keep our community safe. We are not New York. You cannot apply principles of New York. Thank you very much. Load. Next speaker, please. Please be on the... Vedana, if you could please state your name. Hi, this is Vedana with Lean Max Energy. I live here in the county. Um, I want to say amen, Hunter, amen, Courtney, amen, Dr. Hurtado, and um, David Patrick. You guys are right on. This has become clear to us that our representatives do not want to open or go to bat for us. Um, we are going to hear, um, we are going to be lectured about public health over profit. It's a Marxist statement that is also disgusting, implying that people are greedy and just want money and they don't care about public health because they want to have income. They want to have profit. They don't want to lose their businesses and everything they work for. They need income to manage their lives, to feed their family, shelter their family, provide security for their family. They don't want to lose everything that they have worked for. And that makes us selfish. I think it makes you selfish to demand that your fear has to cripple everybody else and take away our rights. The last one of the last speakers said that this doesn't impinge on our rights. It most absolutely does. We're also going to be told to follow the science. My question to you is which science? The science of Fauci, of Fauci Burke that was off by a factor of 25. Huge. We shut down a country over this false model. Then there was the science that pivoted to Bill Gates' model, which is off by a factor of seven. That's still huge. Both of those models took into account sheltering in place. So now we're going to hear, yeah, but we sheltered in place. We, we, we saved everybody. Those models took into account shelter in place and they were still wrong. Yeah, but we flattened the curve. Great. You flattened the curve, but you also widened it. This is a flu. It's 98% of the cases are considered mild. The morbidity rate is under 1% like other flus. This is even a nasty flu. It might even be more contagious, but it is a flu and it's going to be here every year. We still don't have a vaccine for HIV. We still don't have a vaccine for SARS, and this is a version of SARS. And even if we did, less than 50% of the people are going to take it. And then of those people, the vaccines only work 30% of the time. That is not a good argument for moving forward. We need to remove the mask order now. We need to state all of our businesses are essential. And you need to go to bat to us against the governor instead of just following along like lemmings on these orders that make no sense at all to the rest of us. And the, and the doctor was right. The masking is exactly a social tool. That's what it is, a social tool, tool that creates fear and disparity in the community. And I think you need to get rid of that. All the businesses are essential and go to bat. Otherwise, people are going to open without you. Thank you. Next speaker. Elia, if you could please state your name. Hi, Elia Salima. Thank you for taking my call. I want to thank the supervisors for following the governor's guidelines. I know that um, there are people out there that are having some very, some difficult times, but uh, the most important thing is life over anything else. And I, I find it at odd that um, Dr. Hurtado says that we all, you know, when the day you're born that you're guaranteed you're going to die. I realize that, but even Dr. Fauci has said that we do not. He hopes that we do not have that many infected 
so that we would have herd immunity. In other words, we need to get more people infected and we're trying to do the opposite. We don't want people infected. I want to quote, uh, say a quote from Isaac Asimov. There is a cult of ignorance in the United States and there has always been the strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. We need to follow science. We need to follow the facts. We need to follow the data. We need to be wary of emotions that are pulling the strings of political decisions and making sure that we get back on track we want to be able to open up these businesses. We want to be able to get back to a normal life, but we're never, we're not going to have it after this. We're not going to have a normal life. I think we need to assure ourselves that we are in a point where we don't have that many infected. We had a new one yesterday. We have two new last week. People are saying that it's kind of like the people that are calling in are, are, are kind of like, Hey, I'm young. If I get it, I'm going to survive. And you know what? You're old. You've lived. I don't care if you die. I want to freedom. No one is taking your freedoms away. It is a respect for the other person to wear the mask because you may be infected and you may be asymptomatic and you don't know. And even if you go test it today and it's negative, tomorrow or next week, you may get infected and, you, and then you're going to be positive and you don't get the test again. So it's, there's a confusion out there that is run by emotion, and we need to set that back down a little bit because no one is holding anybody back from living their lives. We just have to adjust to a new way of living right now. And this inconvenience is, is minimal compared to the entire life of people having given yourself the last three months even if we do this for another three months. Thank you even very much. For the best entire community. Next speaker, please. Michelle, if you could please state your name. Michelle? Was this the uh, Michelle that we tried to contact earlier and was, were unable to? Okay, Michelle, if you can hear us, uh, maybe you need to unmute on your phone or your device. <clears throat> it should be on the, the on the app if she's doing it through the app and on the phone to unmute both. Yeah, she has her unmuted on the app. It looks like we unmuted her, but maybe her device is muted. Yeah. <clears throat> Michelle, please feel free to contact either me or any supervisor directly after, and we'll um, get your public comment if in writing if we need to, and we'll put it in the uh, next agenda. Any other uh, speakers? No. If you do wish to make a comment, um, please press star nine or raise your hand. And we do have another one. We'll wait a uh, few uh, seconds here for any other additional public comment in case anybody's delayed in getting their hand raised there. Uh, Maria, if you'd like to state your name. Hello. Hi, this is Maria Lamberson, and I'm a resident of San Benito County, and I want to thank all the supervisors um, who have chosen to stand up against um, and stay at uh, Governor Nathan's directions. I believe that a lot of people here believe that their constitutional rights have been violated. But unfortunately, it has not because the preamble states very clearly, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and I'd like to stop there. Promote the general welfare is what you are doing. You're saving lives. While many people believe that a lot of the statistics are unreal or inflated, 40% of uh, um, Salinas, uh, essential workers that provide for the food on your table have tested positive for COVID. It is very real and it is a pandemic. And although many people here, I am a political scientist and I am also a law student. And 
I cannot believe that many people have been affected in their small businesses. I, I realize that in small business, we all have to try to save for rainy days like the one we've been experiencing. I have a husband who is an essential worker and is out there every day risking his life. Now, while I don't condone that many of these people and individuals need and require the monies in order to survive, I believe that we have a constitutional right to uphold the law in anything because we are a state and we have states' rights. And if those states' rights require us as a community to stay in place while this pandemic is being held, then we should shelter and we should follow the science. John Hopkins has raised concerns about the data and they've established that it is not going away. It is not a common cold. Unlike a lot of people would like to believe, I have grandchildren who I'm sure would love to be in school. But unfortunately at this time, I would rather that they receive their schooling online through computer systems, which is safe. I don't go out a lot and I do wear a mask. And when I wear a mask, I wear it for the other person. I have not tested positive for COVID, nor have I been around anyone who has, but I don't know that. People come and go. This is a bedroom community. And people need to realize that while there's a lot of money in this community, you need to shelter in place until we get this pandemic under control. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate all that you've done. Thank you, next speaker. If you'd like to make a comment, press star nine or raise your hand. All right, we'll bring it back to the board and we have, uh, looks like uh, I think everybody wanted to make a comment. Supervisor Hernandez, go right ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> so, well, it's actually in reference to what the last speaker had mentioned. Uh, she mentioned that we the people, uh, she mentioned the preamble of the Constitution. It's kind of funny because uh, it's kind of, at that point it becomes an inconvenient truth that there is a Bill of Rights and the Bill of Rights addresses the individual rights. Uh, and and it, it definitely struck me as, as uh, it it's took me back a little bit to consider the reality that we're, we're trying to reference the General Welfare Clause as if it applies to individuals. General Welfare Clause is, is a federal uh, statement, so I, I've done a little bit of my homework myself. Um, but if, if we want to get to the Constitution, yeah, to, to me, one, one thing definitely for certain, it needs, it, there's always been a jurisdiction uh, independent of each meeting. There's a, there's a local jurisdiction, there's a state jurisdiction, there's a federal jurisdiction. That's why local control and sovereignty was actually a statement, a very common statement back in, you know, not even 40, 50 years ago because there's got to be ultimately a, an ability for us as, as an example, as, as a local body, to be able to uh, be policymakers and, and do our due diligence to ultimately to re represent the people that, we're that we were elected by so that when we're actually ar articulating these policies that there's a level of jurisdictional authority that we have to apply those laws. And just the same, the state has that, that same broader re reach and so, is, so does the, the feds. But uh, one of the things that really stands out to me, it kind of frustrates me is, uh, you know, we, we have a situation right now where the governor has made a lot of decisions, those decisions that have impacted us greatly. And he's trying to say, you know, ultimately that we, we need to do this because this is what's best for us. Nonetheless, he's damaging an economy and at the same time saying you need to follow us, our state laws, all the while he's basically thumbing his nose at the federal laws, right? He's basically violating those, but it's okay for him to follow, him to basically uh, violate federal laws, but it's, it's not okay for us to, uh, to somehow disagree with him. I'm, you know, my comments, and I'm trying to be very concise and, and, and really um, focused, I'm done. I'm done with the governor. I'm done with his statements. I'm done with his, his <laughs> all over the place policy making. I mean, it's like every day where, you know, at one point in time, I, I, I could have swore I saw an email and it's funny how it's gone that actually mentioned we were gonna go into stage three and it's pretty soon you might have rural counties going to stage three. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, where did that go? Because now I guess it's stage two B. Where did that come from? Stage two B within the last couple of days. And I'm not beating up any of our locals. I, I, part of the frustration that I have is definitely because ultimately if you think about it, this indecisiveness has created a heavy burden on the locals to try to implement something that really has no clarity. Every day the, the, a new formula comes out on how do we implement this and at the same time we find ourselves basically saying, hey, we need to do what the state says even though we don't know what he says or maybe tomorrow he's gonna change his mind. 
I think that creates a lot of confusion. It divides our community. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm hearing definitely a lot of division within the, the, the community. You have folks that are saying, when you listen to the state, even though they're, they're, they're violating the constitutional rights, the 14th Amendment to the people, um, the 14th Amendment, and I, I wanna read it, because we all swore to uphold the Constitution here, and I'm not trying to beat up the Board of Supervisors. I know we're all trying to work hard based off of our own convictions. I have no qualms about every man owning up to their own convictions. But, but again, my comments are more specific to trying to clarify and actually encourage this conversation in a productive way. So if we think about the 14th Amendment or try to listen to the, to the intent of it, it actually says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor de deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protections of the law. So, so if you think about the context of that, COVID-19 was in intended supposedly to protect the people, right, these new processes. But just the same, um, it's now officially a crime to not get COVID-19 because we're basically sheltering in place healthy people. So, so if you don't get COVID-19, if you're doing a good job, guess what? We need to lock you up longer. That's the, that's the solution. That, that is a 21st century amazing uh, minds that we have. That that's the way that we're going to implement a solution to our community. All the while, we're crushing our local economy. I, I, I mentioned to our CAO Espinoza, we had an article, Benito Link, where we hear about Payne's, a local and beloved restaurant, that it's literally getting ready to shutter its doors. Within the next three weeks, if things don't change for them, they're going away forever. And I talk to the owners, so I'm actually friends with them. And it just blows me away that this is the intent, this is literally the way that we roll out solution making is whatever the state says, let's just do it. I'm just done, and I'm, I'm, I, we're, we're this essential, non-essential. There's, there's already cases rolling out, especially when it comes to freedom of religion. There's cases rolling out right now. The lawsuits are piling up. They're going to be stacking up that ultimately try to say essential is what we deem it to be essential, and non-essential is what we deem it to be non-essential. What is, who is we? Is it the elites? I mean, who are the elites? Who are the ones that guide these conversations? Because in my mind, it, you, you tell any business owner they're non-essential, I think it's an insult to them because every business is essential. And I've said it before in the prior meeting, April 28th, that the, the community that, re that basically patronizes these businesses um, and the economy would disagree. That they would all say that basically if these businesses have lasted two or three years, then they're officially essential. And really at that point, we've created literally a divisive opportunity because if you think about it, if this was really about risk, why didn't we start with risk? So I hate to be redundant and repeat, but um, I'm just, I'm officially done. I mean, there was one, <clears throat> one other thing that came up that just really threw me for a loop. My wife works in the workman comp industry. All of a sudden we have an executive order and this is not for my, my words, this is actually from Cal Chamber, where the executive order puts the presumption of liability on the business owner. It says you have to prove that this person didn't get sick in your business. As if you can control this person's life 24 hours a day, the moment they leave, how do you know? How can you prove a virus? and all of a sudden you're putting a liability on the business themselves? That's crazy to me. Are you trying to intentionally implode your economy? I mean, and there was another article that I just read that actually mentions that our, our basically our governor references the, 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 the fallout that's happening in his reserves. He, you know, his own finance department is now projecting a $50.3 billion deficit. That's double his own reserves. And what does he say? What is the answer that he says? Oh, we are not going to be in a position, even as the nation's fifth largest economy, to provide to the needs of all the cities and counties without federal support, the very federal government that he's thumbing his nose at. I don't get it. It makes no sense to me. It's like if we want unity, then we need consistency and clarity, and that is not happening. So I'm, I'm officially done, and I personally, you know, I'm one board of supervisor, but uh, I'm done with his orders. I. I as far as I'm concerned, we need to walk away from and we need to do what we can to try to keep our own community together because right now it's falling apart. It's going to get worse. Pains is just a semblance of it. I'm, you know, I'm seeing emails of war notices, which is the ultimately the Worker Act retraining notification. It's a, it's, it's a requirement by law that basically says if you're going to shut down as a mass layoff, you have to notify, you know, basically your employees. And that's happening all over. You know, this is, this, this is serious stuff right now. And what we're talking about is how do we control one case a day? And that's just madness to me. As far as I'm concerned, I'd lobby the board that the only way we're gonna get these answers, these questions answered about 
you know, uh, literally violating people's constitutional rights, the only way we're gonna get answers with all the different questions that I had is if we sue them. And that's just my petition. As an individual board member, I think a lawsuit is in place. Granted, we're a small community, we might lose. Doesn't matter, there's precedent there, there's federal government that's basically saying they themselves are trying to protect civil rights of individuals uh, in, in, our, in our states. So there's, that, there's the, the attorney general from the federal government that's saying, if, you don't, if you're not trying to protect civil, civil rights, I'm gonna, we're gonna have to pull your funding. So at what point does this stop? So that's my pitch to the board, is uh, we sue the state, we walk away from his orders, and that's, that's where I stand. And I have no regrets about what I said. I know people are gonna come after me for saying what I say, you know, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, my convictions are stronger than anybody's ability to attack me. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, Supervisor Botello. Well, uh, no, it's a hard, hard one to follow uh, about. I'm going to just kind of voice my opinion of, you know, we've been having special meetings um, weekly uh, during this crisis, the Board of Supervisors, uh, to try to keep the public informed where we're at. Um, and what we're doing. Uh, I, I think we've made real good uh, strides. Um, we worked with our neighboring counties up to the north when they went to shelter in place uh, when they did, rather uh, a few days ahead of this, even the state, as far as trying to um, minimize the impact of COVID-19. And, and I think the success has been that now we're in position to move forward with the variants because we took uh, such aggressive actions. And, you know, very public comment, you know, a lot of those people that spoke, I, I got to know and, and known them for a long time. Um, we feel for the businesses, we feel for their employees. Uh, we know the pain is real and and none of us are taking it lightly I, I i've never seen this county work harder than it has uh during this crisis our staff has not had a day off there's no such thing as an eight hour day uh the public health department has done everything that they possibly uh could to help us move forward we are moving forward um but you look at the stats you know, COVID-19, there's more and more cases every day in this country and in, in our state. And with that, there's more deaths. And for us to kind of walk away from, you know, orders, uh, health orders from our doctors, uh, whether at the state level or the local level, I don't think that is a, a, a wise move because if we do and somebody dies needlessly, um, you know, it could be me, it could be you, your mom, your child. And right now, I, uh, we've, I, I think we have to stay the course. Um, and, you know, reading that John Hop Hopkins uh, report is kind of enlightening. I uh, think everybody should uh, try to get that report and read it. You know, we're trying to do little things too, you know, as far as, you know, I, I know the two cities and, and the county, uh, our RMA director, I had the conversation to try to uh, waive the restaurant parking requirements so that we could have more outdoor seating. I think he's working on that right now and to try to, uh, as we go through stage two B or whatever it is, um, that you know we're trying to give our businesses a, a you know a, a chance but we we have to be in compliance of what the state is doing and i know i'm gonna have rocks thrown at me and um but we're a subdivision of the state we don't get to pick and choose the laws that we follow uh, there's a lot of laws long before this that i wish i could break but uh, if we're be a law-abiding um, society, we have to comply. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've been having a lot of meetings and um, Supervisor Hernandez and I have been working very, very hard 
um, with the roadmap to recovery with our businesses. And uh, we had a meeting with uh, the two cities and our staff. And one of the things that popped up last Thursday was a, um, we could meet most of the requirements of the variants, except one was the testing uh, in the community. And it just so happened I had a conversation with Supervisor, uh, Supervisor Gilio um, about that issue and that problem. And he said, well, you know, I have a, me a meeting this evening uh, with CSAC uh, and their executive committee. Uh, it was a conference call at 7 o'clock in the evening, and he asked me to join him. Uh, and, um, and I was happy to do so. And, and he was, uh, uh, who was on the line with the Health and Human Services Secretary uh, uh, Ghazi. I, I, uh, Dr. Ghali. Yeah, I can't pronounce his name. I, I don't know what's the deal with all these doctors that none of them I could pronounce their names. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, anyhow, um, there was probably a hundred supervisors and CAOs on, on that conference call. And I was very proud at, um, to be on there. Uh, with so many le uh, local leaders, and they're all pushing the same thing. We gotta address the needs of our businesses and our people um, in, at the local level. And some of this, these state standards just don't quite fit what's happening at the local level. You know, rural is not the same as urban, and some of these, uh, you know. Uh, requirements are be very difficult for counties to meet with the, this variance and we're one of the few that do and uh, so there was two executive uh, supervisors on CSAC that got to ask questions of the secretary and then Shasta County supervisor and then our very own supervisor Gilio asked a, a very key question on, on the testing requirements and the answer that came from the doctor was, yeah, that's a mis, uh, misunderstanding. It, it, you actually do qualify, and I think uh, Supervisor Gilio, chair, temporary chairman, uh, he'll probably comment on some of, uh, of that conversation. Fact of the matter is, is that we need to continue to push the state to e uh, evaluate these stages and the businesses. And I urge some of the public comments, those pe people, to you know, come down as hard on, on, on the governor's office and, and the state as they are coming down on us on something that we can't change. Um, it would, I would hope it would pay dividends because you're not the only ones in the state that uh, are facing these, uh, this crisis. And we, we want to kind of cont continue to move forward with the state and and have a safe reopening, and and I'm going to do everything I can to um, make sure we public health is met, and 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 hopefully the businesses get the guidance and comply with that that guidance uh, until this uh, COVID-19 is for certain, um, you know, in check. With that, that's my comments, Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Medina. I have nothing, but if there's nothing else to say, I'd like to uh, talk about the, number one, there's a couple of things that we have to take care of. Wanted to, I didn't know if you had comments. I can come in after your comments. Um, sure, uh, I'll just make a couple of quick comments. So thank you, Supervisor Rotello, for, for talking about the meeting from last week. There was an emergency California State Association of Counties meeting. We're um, able to talk directly to the secretary that's in charge of essentially this response uh, across the statewide directly under the governor, Dr. Galley. And um, so people know, uh, the, I'll speak for myself personally, uh, I, I've written a personal letter um, that I published to the community and also to the governor. I've um, tried to be on every possible OES um, governor, any call that I can, can be on. I've, I've spoke to Assembly Member Rivas. Um, I've been playing phone tag with uh, Senator Caballero, but I've also expressed my concerns to her. We, 
we need to look at this not as a, a blanket situation. And I think finally the state is starting to understand that this is not one size fits all for you know uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Benito. We're not in the same situation. Um, there's several small counties. Uh, I believe uh, Modoc up north is one of the few that has zero um, infections or had, has had zero infections. Uh, we uh, at San Benito County uh, jumped on this very early. We asked the community to do a, a lot and the community has done an, an unbelievable job and I'm, I'm, s I'm so thankful and impressed that, that we have because, because of that, our infection rate is incredibly low. Our uh, previous uh, doctor, uh, Dr. Marty, and our current doctor and our health department has done an amazing job to get testing here. If you look at OptumServe testing, if we didn't have that, we wouldn't even qualify or be able to move into phase two and, and continue the way we're going. So we've met all these very stringent requirements. Uh, the, uh, the, the application will be online here shortly. It'll, it's a public document. You can look at the, the work that has gone into this, the level of detail that had to go into this to make sure that we can move forward into phase 2B. And that's what I'm pushing for. And we're, we're all pushing for the same thing. And, and for, I don't think, um, I don't wanna speak for the entire Board of Supervisors, but I, I, the sense I get from hearing all the comments is nobody likes the situation that we're in. Nobody wants to open uh, business sooner than, um, than all of us working for you up here. We, we, I would say the majority of us are just concerned about safety and, and regressing backwards so we don't have to go back to um, perhaps a more restrictive state. We wanna make sure we do it right. And I think we are moving in, in the right direction and we're moving as quickly as, as possible. We've learned uh, this last week that there are consequences for counties that perhaps choose not to um, follow the, the uh, state's order. And um, if you need any more information on that, you can take a look at Yuba and uh, Sutter. There was a letter from Cal OES that went out to them about uh, funding. And so we're, we're watching all that. And we're paying attention to all that. And we're pushing as hard as we possibly can to safely move forward. And um, uh, go ahead, uh, Supervisor Medina. Yes, I know uh, on my regular agenda, there's two things that we need to vote on or talk about. The first one is dealing with a letter to the uh, governor, and this was signed by our chair. And I'd like to change that if, possibly, if possible. And rather than have the chair sign it, have each individual supervisor sign it. That's the first one. And then the second one, of course, is the letter that we need to uh, send to the public health officer, I believe, which will go to the governor. It's it's Thank correct. You. It's codifying the letter. Yes, Got sir. It. So the first motion I'd like to make is to sign a letter with all the supervisors rather than just the uh, the chair. Mr. Chair, so if I could make a, a couple changes to the letter. Yes, ma'am. Just ma because uh, I know that we have to increase the number of cases to 56 and the number of active cases to one because it states two. Okay. And I noticed that there was missing an or in one of the sentences. And if we could delete the last sentence of the first paragraph, I think it would. Uh, what is the last? I, I don't have it in front it of says me. A hair salon in our county, which may only have one chair and one beautician is different from a hair salon in Los Angeles County, which may have 20 or 30 cosmo cosmetologists. Why do you want to change that? Because I, another sentence might be better. Businesses in our county um, may be different than businesses of the same category in a larger county, just more general. Yeah. I'd, yeah. I'd rather keep that in there. Okay. But can we keep it and then add the general statement as well? Pardon? Let's have the specific statement and then also the general statement as well, please. Yes. Was that okay. thank you. Yes, that's, okay. that's so we're covering the salon yes, specifically sir. and then in general everybody? Yes. Yes, sir. Mic. Your mic, sir. Oh, sorry. Why don't you, if, you, if you're comfortable, why don't you second and then add a friendly amendment if, yeah. if you're comfortable with that? Well, I, I, you know, I'll second it, but, but I want to definitely add a friendly amendment. Go ahead. <clears throat> um, if at all possible to work with the governor, I would love <laughs> to see if he would listen to us. Uh, I don't have confidence in him, but nonetheless, um, I think there needs to be a, a very strong recommendation that he considers what it means to allow us to have our, basically to respect our own local plan. I shouldn't say allow, but we need to have our own local plan. Um, and that balance is protecting three things, civil liberties, public health, and the economy. I think 
in my mind, he needs to go back and do more homework because if he's not balancing these three, he's destroying communities. That's my friend, Larry Mamet. I, th I think that may, may be um, just a suggestion for the board. I'm looking for a consensus. If you look at the paragraph that says, our county will work immediately in preparing a plan which would allow more businesses to open while preserving and maintaining public health, perhaps we can add those three items in there. Is that acceptable to the board, the three items that the supervisor mentioned? Just add a sentence in there that I, while keeping I can, in mind. I concur with that friendly amendment. Okay. Promote public health, civil liberties, and what was the third one? Uh, the economy. Okay. Okay. With uh, those uh, changes, what's the will of the board? A yes Aye. is supporting the will. Mark, the yes. Changes. Supervisor Hernandez. Yes. Gilio, yes. Yes. Battelli S40. The Next, uh, we need a, uh, like a, a motion to deal with the uh, attestation letter that was already sent this morning to um, the uh, state, and I'm looking for a motion to support that letter that was sent. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Okay. First, uh, we had a motion by Battello and a second by Medina, and I'll call for the question. Aye. 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 Medina, yes. 4040. All right. Moving on to our next item. Uh, CAO, do you want to make some comments? Sure, or I'll, I'll go ahead and open up. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. As, as everyone is aware, today is actually a special board meeting, it was, and it was actually uh, documented for our budget. Um, obviously, um, COVID 19 has had many impacts on everybody, and as including um, preparation of budget, um, understanding uh, what the state's budget is, as well as uh, the feds, um, because uh, as many are aware that we are um, tightly knit with the state with regards to funding. So um, we have Stuart Petrie here, he's a budget officer, he's gonna be reviewing with your board some highlights with, through a PowerPoint presentation um, of uh, plans for our budget, and he's gonna give you some dates, as well as covering um, uh, different elements of um, reserves, as well as uh, other things that we have, uh, some, some actually good things that we may have as well that he'll talk about. So, Stuart. Uh, good morning, uh, Vice Chair, board members. Um, so I just wanna highlight <coughs> at the uh, last uh, special meeting, uh, we did uh, revise the budget timeline. Um, and so to kind of uh, just uh, refresh everyone's memory, um, we are planning on June 15th, which was also a special uh, board meeting that we usually uh, start the public hearings. Uh, the administration office will bring the recommended budget to the board. Um, for review um, and then the approval and that would be uh, that would if, if adopted by your board um, would be the spending authority starting July 1st um, that would then follow um, a notice of public hearing um, July tw by, tr by July 23rd um, and then we would have uh, public hearings uh, starting August 3rd um, and after the public hearings, any adjustments that are made by the board um, and the in the public comment period, um, we would move forward um, with the board adopting the uh, the final adopted budget uh, to start the uh, 2021 year. Um, so. Just to just to start, now that we are going into phase two, there is gonna be some uh, new sectors uh, reopening um, here locally and throughout the state, which does affect us locally, especially with our county pools and some of the other realignment dollars that come straight to the county. Um, just wanted to highlight some of the, the unemployment um, numbers. The governor's office, uh, his finance team is actually projecting that unemployment could rise to about 18%. Um, again, it's still really the full impact. Um, we just don't know um, what it's going to look like um, either here um, or, or nationally. Um, 
one of the things uh, that pushing off our public hearings was to address some of the issues as we get more information. Um, we've had a lot of discussions. Uh, we just had our quarterly sales tax update with HDL um, and they provided us some information. But again, they even warned us, these are just you know some initial models uh, that they've come up with. Uh, this is not necessarily what the final outlook is gonna look like. Um, the, uh, I have revised this general fund uh, revenue uh, slide that we did present last month as well. Um, again, uh, property tax, we are not hearing any neg negatives in property valuations. Again, the state has a, uh, uh, a supply issue um, that is keeping up demand, that is not equaling our demand and is keeping valuations fairly high. Again, this is not similar to the last recession where we had the, um, the property bust. Um, the one uh, revision from last month uh, is the sales tax fi figures. We got some more accurate information on that. Again, the revised are a little bit lower than I had presented uh, the previous month. Um, those sales taxes estimates include both the Prop 172 public safety tax that go to um, our local safety agencies and also our general sales tax uh, that can be used for um, uh, any of the uh, board appropriated uh, uh, functions. Um, regarding the 2011 and 1991 realignment, this is funding that we also receive through sales tax and vehicle license fees. Um, these go to pay social services, public safety, and our mental health. This includes AB 109 funding. Um, I just wanted to highlight that uh, the initial estimates are about a 14.7% reduction uh, current year. Um, that'll be uh, in for the 2011 realignment monies and in the 1991 realignment monies, we're gonna see about an 18% reduction. Um, in terms of dollars, uh, this is looking to be uh, over a million dollars um, in reductions. Um, and these are going to our services at HSA, uh, Behavioral Health, um, and also to AB 109, which funds a, uh, uh, a lot of different services, um, including uh, uh, sheriff's corrections officers, um, uh, different programming, um, probation, um, and, and some other local, uh, local programs, um, all revolving around uh, corrections. Um, I have uh, discussed with our HSA and mental health uh, uh, finance uh, folks. Um, they uh, feel very comfortable going into this next year. Um, we have um, high reserves. Um, and, and we do have high reserves in the general fund as well. Um, so we feel confident that any of these shortfalls we can at least uh, uh, gap um, going into this next year. Um, we're gonna have some longer discussions and some long-term goals um, that administration is gonna put together to the board to see what kind of the outlook looks like over the next three years um, with these changes. Um, but I did just wanna highlight that I was informed that um, with our HSA and public health realignment money, we had about six, uh, over $6 million in reserves uh, just with realignment money. And uh, some of those issues we already know of, which are our vacancy and turnover rates, we're not burning through the money as quickly as maybe some other agencies would be. And we don't have any general fund contributions to our health HSA department like some other organizations, uh, local neighboring uh, counties have as well. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, additional highlight that I, I just wanted to note for the board, um, behavioral health has a specific funding source, the MHSA dollars. This is the 1% tax on income to millionaire. Um, that they're expecting uh, the impacts not to be seen till 22, 23. Um, the funding comes in two years late um, based on those years. Um, and that's another, uh, another factor that they were s expecting increases in this next year. So there's, there's some monies there that are gonna be 
bridging those gaps for some of these realignment um, funding dollars. So I just wanted to highlight that for the board. Um, that's my first topic. Is there any, uh, any necessary questions? Um, or I could uh, hold off doing questions at the very end of the whole presentation. I'm going to have a few of these uh, smaller topics within this total presentation. Questions, board? Yes. <coughs> I had a Commander? question. I had a question, Stuart. So, <coughs> so you're saying basically we're fine right now. <coughs> I, I imagine that's because we're very property tax dependent. Yes. Um, long term. I can't imagine that's still going to hold still, right? It all depends on the market. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I, as I'm reading, I'm learning that other counties that are very uh, sales tax or, or TOT, hospitality for sure, dependent, right? That's a big part of the economy that's been crushed. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm reading reports that Monterey County is doing mass layoffs. Uh, so so uh, to what extent have we set a cap in our community and we're going to have to mitigate that cap within the next handful of years? Because I know that means that Right, if there's no new revenues because we pretty much crushed an opportunity to develop tourism in our community, what are we going to do now? Or uh, you can answer that question, but uh, how is it going to look three years from now? Because I, I only imagine those revenues are going to drop as the market drops. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and obviously we're going to be updating that. That's mm -hmm. one of the big things why we're pushing out those public hearings to come back to the board. We're expecting most likely we're going to have to do a larger mid-year adjustment to uh, correct some of our revenue projections. Um, but just at this moment, we're not seeing property tax valuations um, necessarily being affected. And again, like you said, we don't have that major tourism. Um, I mean, if you look at our TOT tax uh, in fiscal year 18, 19, we only collected 200,000. Um, and I might, we might have to correct, uh, adjust that 150 that I'm estimating as well mid-year, um, depending upon, you know, how, how these phase-ins, um, how these phase-ins actually occur. But yeah, that's not a large percentage of our total overall budget. Um, so there's not a lot even to take away from our TOT taxes really. So um, yeah, that's a good, good point. But, it, but in essence, it sets a, we're at a cap, right? Like new revenue is, is, is probably all gone in, in our minds right now because right now everybody's pretty much in damage control mode. Yes, yes, that's correct. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to um, a discussion on our OPEB trust. Um, there's also going to be a discussion on pension as well. Um, just a high level overview of where we're at and what we might see coming into the future with uh, losses to um, our assets um, that we will be seeing, especially with CalPERS pension. Um, I just wanted to, uh, so this table here um, outlines our OPEB trust account. Um, if the uh, board remembers uh, this last year, we also created a secondary account with PARS. Um, so we have our OPEB uh, assets in uh, two um, accounts, OPEB being other post-employment benefits. This is um, for uh, mainly the medical contributions to retirees, healthcare. Um, these, uh, these two valuations at June 30th, we had about 24,000, or sorry, excuse me, 24.4 million. Um, in August of 2019 is when we created the second uh, PARS trust, and there was a split of the two. Um, and additionally, we contributed in excess another $900,000 um, that was uh, uh, authorized by the board to, uh, to include in to funding the OPEB. Um, we saw that balance increase to um, uh, about $26.8 million uh, this December. Um, and then we have overall as of yesterday had about a nine percent decrease um, in total asset value um, this is not necessarily a, uh, uh, obviously this is a cause for concern um, but that wasn't the lowest that we got to so we have seen a rebound um, in our asset values with the market um, kind of fluctuating i'm assuming we're going to see a lot of fluctuations over next year depending upon the phasing and, and, and certain, certain items in the economy. 
um, but most of the assets in here are are of uh, are of a more cash value bonds um, mar money market um, but with the pars account we do have more uh, stocks um, rather than the surbit which is held with the state um, Stuart, can I ask you a quick question on that specifically? Um, yes, sir. So on the, on the I see the 9.2% um, decrease May 11 balance. Not that losing money is ever good. It's always bad. But it, it, have we lost any of our principal or is that our gain because of the, um, the wise financial decisions that, that you guys have made in the past? Um, so I could bring back a actual principal balance but we have been earning quite a lot of interest last year it was about 1.8 million uh years prior uh you know one and a half million so we have earned a lot of interest so i would say that is probably a correct statement to say we definitely haven't lost all of our principal that the county has put in um, but we have lost you know a considerable amount of that interest that can we, we can we take a look at that and then perhaps with joe paul is there is there um you know in the, in the future is something that we don't have to answer right now but we can be prepared is there is there a, st a stop gap a plan that you know if uh, if and when things continue to go um really really bad do we have a, a limit so we protect our our principal so to speak in there and and things like that we can talk about that later or offline if you want to bring it back yeah actually I'm we're go ahead I'm, I'm somewhat going to discuss that on the next okay, slide in a, in, a, in a sense. Um, uh, so I just want to let you know, even with this 9% uh, decrease, we are currently at about an 86% funded mm -hmm. level yeah. for you. OPEB, which is very high um, for, for a local agency um, to have in OPEB uh, balances. Um, currently, uh, administration office is working with our actuary actually to bring the board a long-term spending plan. Um, some of the concerns uh, uh, that administration has is that we haven't had a that long-term spending plan and knowing when we we can stop that uh, the pre-funding levels and start to draw down on the trust so that we're not getting uh, a very high percentage rate, um, you know, over 100% funded um, so that we're kind of hitting a, a, a good level. And we'll bring bringing that back to the board to see, you know, what are the policies that the board would like to put in place on how, how much funding do we want to keep in there? Is there a certain target? Or is it going to be 80%? Is it going to be 110%? Where, where, where does the board want to uh, want to lie with that? So we are going to bring some more discussion back um, with a with a with a bigger with a few set of plans um, that we can present to your board. Um, Mr. Chair, if I may? Yes, please. Just, and just for a clarity, so I want to thank Stuart for all the work he's been doing, but there, there's been a lot of work prior, and as you mentioned, and one of them is um, PEPRA, and addressing the PEPRA, the, the Reform Act, the Cal CalPERS Reform Act, back in approximately uh, 2012, and, and our new employees it, um, coming on board with that. So there's a huge savings there um, when, um, people do, re do retire when those, those people are eligible and they do retire on our OPEB um, trust. So that, those are the calculations that we really want to look at and scrutinize. And some of the preliminary numbers that we have are, are pretty big numbers that we can actually um, not be um, moving forward with the, you know, PAYGO and a lot of these other contributions because we've been putting a lot to it and Supervisor Anthony Botello know, knows that we've been really pushing, putting a lot of money into that. But um, again, we're gonna come back, and Stuart and I were talking about coming back to your board and give you guys a full analysis of that and a plan moving forward with that. So just Perfect. wanted to let that board know. Any additional questions from the board while we're here? <coughs> yeah, uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. So, so when it comes to the, the, the pension funding, is there, I know it's been talked about before about uh, transferring it to a more efficient fund. I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's what we first we did. We allocated a certain amount uh, to PARS, and and you know it was. A, I don't know what the legal aspect of it is, but uh, what is the possibility of, of moving more of it or or all of it? I, I don't know. What is the limitations on that? Um, in, in terms of like moving the whole surbit 
trust uh, or moving everything out of Serbit into the parse trust. Something basically more efficient, which parse seems to be doing a good job. Yeah, so, uh, and I know that was the recommendation of, of uh, Joe Paul, the auditor controller, um, and, and he brought this recommendation to the board based on um, the history of parse and and the uh, the gains that they were that they've been able to make historically, um, beat you generally beating the Serbit. Um, this can be made at any time by the board. Uh, I don't know exactly all the legal implications, but I believe at any point in time the board can make the move and move the rest of the Serbit into pars if uh, if that's the decision the board would like to make. Just to comment too, as, as well as for a point of clarity too. I know every year we've come to your board and actually have given a presentation on PARS and CERBIT. And um, we tried PARS um, some years back just to kind of dabble and say, is this, is this going to work? They were performing. So I think last year is when Joe Paul Gonzalez, our auditor, came in and presented. And we said, let's do a 50-50, and let's see how they perform. So, um, so with that being said, um, obviously the times right now with the stock market and all these other things happening, um, you know, there have to be some real looking at it and some analysis done. But, um, you know, this year, you know, we normally invite Joe Paul to come down and give a full presentation on this as well to, to look at and evaluate it. So, you know, the time's still not up for this year. We could still do that. Uh, maybe at our next special meeting, special board meeting, we can do that with your board. Um, but this is kind of what happened and what transpired. I just wanted to elaborate that for you, Supervisor Hernandez. Thank you. Any other questions from board members uh, on that? Um, if we do bring a presentation back, let's talk about the pros and cons about diversification and you know spreading it across multiple funds. And if we get hit in one fund, what that looks like. Thank you. Stuart, whenever you're ready, go right ahead. Okay. Um, so, and, and I just wanted to highlight, and, and this was kind of the reason that this has been brought up by administration department to, to bring attention to the board. Um, we are, are, are in a sense, uh, funding at an extremely high level, OPEP, um, and, and knowing, you know, especially now with losses in revenue um, and, and, our, and our issues with trying to, uh, with increased expenditures, um, we just wanted to take this into consideration as a point to uh, start looking at in decreasing some of our ongoing expenditures. Um, just for, for reference, the estimated costs for fiscal year 1920 including the PAYGO, which is the current retiree cost of health care, and the additional pre-funding that the board uh, has been authorizing the last few years, which is approximately $1,000 per employee, uh, comes about to $2.4 million. Um, the normal actuarial, uh, on, on our actuarial valuation report, um, they normally, the regular standard is to go with their actuarial determined contribution, which is about 1.4 million. Um, so we are funding over and above their recommendation and their recommendation gets you to a 100% uh, funding level in 20 years. Um, now, if you make these additional payments, uh, this obviously changes and you get to the fun that 100% funded faster. Um, so currently we're, we're working with the actuary to draft that long-term pay plan. Um, preliminarily, we, we looked at a plan that would include just a $500,000 contribution from the, from the county, and we would be able to meet um, our PAYGO obligations and get to 100% funded within 20 years as an example. So that's just a preliminary uh, uh, plan that we looked at, um, and we will bring more information to the board with a few different types of options that, that can be looked at. So we just wanted to uh, bring that up as a potential uh, source of decreasing um, countywide expenditures. So, um, Additionally, uh, just want to discuss the pension impacts. Um, the... Uh, in, I believe it was February, there was a record high um, of, of asset value um, at CalPERS of, uh, of $404 billion. Um, the, the asset market value hit a low of about $335 billion um, on March 19th. Um, the v current valuation, because the market has regained um, somewhat 
um, on May 11th was at 376 and a half billion. Um, obviously, we are not going to be meeting our discount rate, which is 7% with CalPERS for this year. And that's, the, uh, that's their uh, target rate that they try to achieve uh, earning interest um, on, the, on the assets. Um, if we don't meet that, that increases the unfunded liability, meaning there's more costs down the road. Now for the, our county and for other local organizations, you're not actually gonna see that impact for two years because of the dates that they do the valuation reports. The last valuation report was in 2018. So we already are locked in on our contributions for, not, for the 2021 year. Same will go when they come out with the, uh, the, next, uh, the next report, which would have been at June 30th, 2019. That'll be for 21, 22, for example. Um, so we won't really see the impact from two years from now, but we are anticipating that there will be some larger changes again with that. Now we were already expecting changes uh, due to the fact that that 7% discount rate, CalPERS had changed a year prior from 7.5%. So they were anticipating less gains anyways. So uh, now we'll show that what we're expecting this next year for increases, but just wanted to highlight that. Um, so for, uh, these are our three uh, pension plans, the miscellaneous safety, and the safety is split between the PEPRAs and the classic members. Um, we are seeing uh, about 400,000 in miscellaneous, 100,000 in safety, and 30,000 in the PEPRA safety. Additionally, um, I believe all of our funding percentages have uh, essentially decreased because that unfunded liability has increased because of the actuarial estimates with the decreases in the discount value. So I know that's a, a lot to speak on, but I just wanted to highlight where we were at as of, and this is the most up-to-date information that I get from CalPERS is basically two years back. Uh, June 3rd, 2018, we were at 70% funded in our miscellaneous plan, which is um, the largest plan. Um, so we just wanted to highlight that and recognize that we are expecting increases in the current year or, or in the 2021 fiscal year of pension increases. Um, the next topic that, uh, that our office wanted to, to provide to the board was some um, updates on the enterprise fund. Um, there was a new contract that was entered into in October um, of this last year um, and we wanted to highlight some of those, uh, the term, the changes in the terms that are actually, um, this is a very positive for, uh, for uh, our local government and, and of the things that we're gonna be able to, uh, that the board is gonna be able to accomplish. Um, just wanted to highlight uh, the components here. Um, we have uh, changes uh, increased to uh, haul route payments uh, which are about $200,000 per year, up to 2 million, um, depending on the final expansion approval. Um, there's the annual road impact payments, which are a dollar per ton. Um, we're estimating, and that's gonna be, that specific piece is ongoing. Um, and that money is gonna be deposited directly into the road impact fee fund, or the, sorry, the road fund. And it'll be specifically earmarked um, for the board to authorize uh, a usage on that. Um, and that'll be approximately 348,000 per year. Um, additionally, in the contract, uh, there were increases to the landfill depletion fee. Um, and we're expecting that uh, for general fund operation costs, we're gonna be able to pull from that fees approximately 500 to $750,000 per year. Um, and then, on top of that, there was another item in there, which was the John Smith Fairview Road um, item, which was a $2 million uh, towards those projects upon the final expansion approval. Uh, just wanted to highlight that. That may be some years out, but some of these other m monies we will be seeing coming up this next year, the, two, the haul route payments, the annual road impact uh, payments as well. Um, additionally, did want to highlight that the board has already allocated approximately four and a half uh, million dollars towards uh, the haul route uh, 
towards uh, Best Road, um, John Smith, some of the, and Fairview um, for projects uh, related to those impacts from the, from the landfill. Just wanted to make sure um, those were highlighted and um, a lot of that, a lot of those projects are gonna be starting this next year. Um, some have already started in the current year. I know they're in design phase on a lot of projects with our engineers right now, so. Stuart, let's pause there. Any questions from the board regarding enterprise funds before we move on to capital? Seeing none, go ahead, Stuart. Um, additionally, just wanted to highlight, uh, we are still working on the Capitol Road uh, Bridge program to include in the recommended budget, but just wanted to highlight some of the items that we are gonna be seeing this next year. Um, for example, uh, the behavioral health building, that project's gonna get started um, and moving forward. It's been, they've been working on it, um, but there's, there should be more uh, construction seen in the in fiscal year 2021. Additionally, we have the homeless shelter phase three, um, which is approximately a million dollars. And then additionally, the heat project, the low income housing um, project as well, um, which will be included um, our, on our capital list. There's a, there were many more uh, requests, uh, especially for deferred maintenance um, that we will be highlighting to the board um, when we finalize the list um, that we'll be bringing with the recommended budget as well. Stuart, on that specifically, this is Jim Gilio. Can you um, speak to, th these are all uh, funds that have been fund developed. These aren't general fund dollars, correct? Yes, so these specific funds, the behavioral health building, uh, we, uh, we went out and got uh, some, uh, uh, funding through a COP issuance uh, certificate of participation, uh, similar to a bond um, that is going to be paid through uh, MHSA and other realignment monies uh, from behavioral health. Uh, that is money that is allocated to behavioral health that cannot be used for any uh, general fund uh, uh, function. Um, additionally, the homeless shelter phase is also gonna come from uh, HSA monies and the heat project was a grant funded project as well. So yes, there is, uh, for these three projects, there are no general fund dollars coming out. Thank you. Um, so uh, this list right here uh, is the list of our uh, eight bridge projects. Uh, we are gonna start seeing some more movement in fiscal year 2021. A lot of them are still in the design phase, but we should see construction moving forward. There will, uh, should be completion of the Shore and San Felipe Road Bridge uh, soon here. And then the Hospital Road Bridge should be the next big one moving into construction. Um, again, the, uh, most of these projects are federally funded 100%, but there are, uh, I believe it is the Union Road Project uh, that there is a need for the local portion um, and then one of the other two, but those other two are not as large of an amount. Um, I believe the Union Road's closer to four million uh, from, the, uh, from the local match portion. We've identified that we will probably be able to uh, propose to the board to use uh, road impact fees because of the overlay of the Union Road. It's also gonna include, uh, by doing that project, it's also include road improvements. Um, so we can directly correlate that to those impact fees. So. Um, just wanted to highlight um, some of the projects that we should be seeing moving forward. Um, these are gonna ramp up and move, move fairly quickly as, as they get designed and, and move forward with the construction phase. Um, additionally, uh, and I have not finalized the road uh, project list, but we will we'll finalize that and, and present that to the board in the recommended budget. Um, we have the SD1 projects from the previous year of 1.7 million. Additionally, I believe the board already approved the, uh, the, the next set of uh, project lists, which includes next year's dollars and some savings that we've seen. Um, that's why that amount was a little higher, it was closer to $3 million. Um, additionally, we have some Measure G uh, projects that should be moving forward. Those are all in the design phase as well. Um, I believe uh, talking to the engineers and RMA, there should be about $1.7 million of those projects starting up. Um, and then we have uh, land, landfill hall routes, um, uh, projects that should be coming online as well. Um, so just wanted to highlight that. There's probably a few things that I might've missed here, 
um, and we're, we're finalizing the, the roads list right now um, to include in the recommended budget. So, Supervisor McGee. Sure. The uh, landfill haul routes, does that come from the enterprise fund? The, the plan, are you referring to any rehabilitation of the roads? Yes, yes that, that is gonna be um, the, main, the main source of, of where the funds are gonna come so from. So once again, that's person. paid by in theory, paid by the uh, waste connections. Waste connections, that is correct. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the board? On this? No. Go ahead, Stuart. Um, so there are a few uh, budget policy changes that we wanted to uh, propose to the board uh, to, to, to look at. Um, one of them is a, uh, a revision to our general fund reserve policy, um, kind of codifying it and getting the formal policy adopted um, and it will include some of the items that the board has actually already moved forward on, and I'm gonna highlight those as well. Additionally, uh, with these new uh, uh, transfers in and out of the enterprise fund, there is a recommendation here um, to look at a enterprise reserve uh, policy, just to protect the county and any risk or uh, litigation or, or any issues related to our enterprise uh, fund as well. And just wanted to highlight that um, we're not proposing any policy to adopt today that would be brought back to the board. This is just for uh, consideration discussion um, for the board uh, to look at. Um, we've already started drafting the policy, so we would bring a draft to the board to review um, and to make any changes that they that you would like to see. Um, so. Uh, one of the reasons why, or one of the main reasons why we brought up the general fund reserve policy stemmed from our standard and poor's uh, credit rating. Um, one of the things that, uh, that was missing was an official formal adopted policy of our general fund reserve. Um, now, this is a part of the management scoring portion of our credit rating. And when you have these policies with form w being formally adopted um, and, and codified, um, it, it provides them, um, uh, I guess, additional assurance that we will have enough cash flow and reserves for any downturns or unanticipated revenue shortfalls. Um, so that is one of the main reasons why we are bringing up this policy today. Um, and uh, just for reference, um, I know uh, I've talked to, to some of the supervisors about this. The GFO rec GFOA's recommendation is normally about two months of operating expenditures, comes out to about 16%. Um, but for, for purposes of our general fund reserve structure, um, I would think of it as three different parts. Um, the board has already, ob and these are all funding that would be in the general fund um, in, our, in our fund balance. The uh, first one is the pension obligation reserve, which the board has already put that funding away. It was approximately $3 million. The proposal would be to keep that at the $3 million minimum. This is another PARS trust separate from the OPEB that I discussed earlier. Uh, but just wanted to highlight that that is in our general fund. That should be considered part of our general fund reserve pol policy um, as, uh, as, as funding that could be used during a downturn or rainy day for pension. Additionally, uh, we normally have adopted a emergency disaster reserve. The board has normally adopted an emergency da disaster reserve, approximately a million dollars. We have used substantially most of that this year due to the COVID pandemic, but I, it, this, this has been adopted multiple years by the board already. So if that is still the, the way that the board would like to go, um, we think it would be uh, prudent to include that in the reserve policy. Um, and then additionally, um, we would have a uh, somewhat of a new portion to this, which would, we would call we can name it something else, but this was just an idea, uh, economic uncertainty reserve, which would be about 15% of operating expenditures. That would be used for any revenue shortfalls, any downturn separate from the pension rainy day or the emergency disaster. So kind of a separate set of funds that doesn't have to be drawn down um, um, separate from those two specific items, which are uh, looming problems. Um, 
Additionally, uh, just wanted to highlight that if we went with a structure in this sense, we would be able to show approximately 25% of operating expenditures held in reserve in our general fund reserve policy um, with, with these three items. We could decrease the economic uncertainty reserve if, we, if, if, that, if the board felt that we were prudent um, um, or we could change this in any way, but we just wanted to highlight that this is a, this is a discussion that we'll bring back to the board. We'll bring back a recommendation and a, and a draft policy um, but we just wanted to highlight that. Um, and, and I wanted to stop there because I think this is probably something that the board might want to ask questions or Supervisor discuss. Medina, I think you uh, indicated you want to speak. Yeah, how, d I, on the enterprise reserve, you were talking about enterprise reserve at the very beginning? Yes. Where do you come up with, with uh, the? I would, it's yeah. a separate policy yes but where would you come up with the percentage or anything like that that's I understand the other part but on the enterprise reserve it would just be really for litigation right yeah so I I, I had a discussion with with Harry um, and, uh, sorry uh, Harry Madrigenes RMA director um, and our uh, integrated waste manager Kathleen Gallagher um, and uh, basically I would let that rest on their recommendation and bring that recommendation to the board if the board wishes to make any adjustment. Um, I'm not recommending a percentage base just because uh, we wanna be able, uh, or, or from the contract, there was other items in there that would be used toward, that yeah. we, we would wanna keep the money freed up for the board to choose to make uh, uh, you know, contributions to roads or to the general fund that would allow that to be freed up. So uh, we were looking at potentially like a flat dollar amount, okay. like a million dollars. That's, as that's that. perfect. Thank you. Yeah. I had a question, Mr. Chair. Right so, um, Stuart, you mentioned, uh, you know, that last slide, not this one, 15% uh, of operating expenditures. So how many weeks does that keep us o open when it comes to economic uncertainty? Let's say we get you know, we're at, you know, basically we have to use up those funds. How long is that? Uh, that is just shy under two months. Two months. So what is the normal recommended? I mean, I, I have my my own, you know, from, from, from CFOs that I've talked to, they, they say you need six months reserves, uh, especially when you're dealing with a downturn that gives you enough enough time to, to, to not have to slash positions and ultimately have to really cut your bottom line down to, to uh, minimal operating. So if we want to keep our operating at 100%, what do you what would you recommend? Well, well, we could go with we we could go with a lot of different um, uh, objectives and, and and different types of uh, of policy on this. Um, one thing is uh, we have been funded at about a 50% in available uh, reserve reserve balance. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it all depends on how the board wants to approach it. I mean, uh, there might be, you know, uh, deferred maintenance that the board wants to work on. There might be road projects, there might be other things. So, um, I guess it, it all comes down to a risk, uh, mitigation factor. How much do we need to, does the board want to put out for, uh, for projects or how much does the board want to save? Um, now we can, uh, there's, uh, there's some uh, GFOA um, uh, basically exercises that we can go through that I'm gonna be looking at with Ray um, to come up with a, and this was just a simple recommendation based off of GFOA's minimum recommendation, which is two months. We can go higher, obviously. And what I would probably recommend doing if, if we really wanna scrutinize um, that reserve amount, probably look at the history. Where were we at with the Great Recession? What did, it, what, what, what did we see with those, those decreases? Because I, I would say that that's probably uh, one of the worst economic downturns that we might see in the future. Not saying that, you know, I mean, I can't predict it, but um, it could be worse than that. But um, we can look at that as, as perspective, um, which might, w w it, which might look at a higher percentage. Um, I'm pretty sure it would, but in the, in the grand scheme of things, it, it's, a, it's really a stopgap for how many years you wanna look at. So if the economy drops 
uh, if we drop revenue 15 percent i'm telling you we could, we would last one year and then we'd have problems going forward um, if it drops five percent i'm telling you we'd have three years um, before we need to make major changes in expenditures um, so so well, on uh, that uh, note so really quick yeah. um, so b for what you're telling me because you said 50 percent so that basically means Right now we're at 50% capacity because we really don't have the employment base to cover what we really need, right? Is that, is that, is that what I'm hearing? Um, there has been a buildup uh, due to one-time revenues. We, we've had some increases. TV2 projects, some of those things that have built up, and we have had uh, retainment and, 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 and vacancy Vacancies. issues mm -hmm. that have mm -hmm. returned uh, mm -hmm. fund balance. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, so, so, so within that context, okay, let's say, you know, 100% of capacity means we have all the f positions filled to run to run the county. Right now, from what I'm hearing, you're saying we're about 50%, right? So there's uh, there's a certain level of, of, of funding that, that is being set aside because we're not using it because we're, we're not able to hire. People aren't, for whatever the reason, we're, we don't, we're not at capacity with when it comes to our staffing levels. Um, I may have misspoke, so maybe I can clarify that. Um, I was just saying that we have about 50% of net of operating expenditures in available fund balance. Um, I'm not saying that we're at 50% operating capacity. Got it, okay. So I, I mixed it too, I apologize. But it's good conversation because I think it kind of puts the, the, the bigger picture question is, I know, I mean, I, I would imagine all of us would agree is we, we're not at full uh, working capacity to run the county. So within that context, how much can we afford to lose um, of that capacity based off of these projections. Right. Uh, uh, go, ahead, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. And, uh, I was just looking at Supervisor Patello next and then uh, Supervisor Medina next. So I think okay. you both have comments. So go ahead, Sue. Well, and we, c we could do a global review of that and bring that back, back to the board. Um, I think, you know, we, we've, we've shown the board the, the normal financial quarterly uh, reports that we have been bringing to the board to, to show. I mean, we've had like 20% vacancies. So, I mean, that's a factor that you could say we're operating at 80% of what we would like to be at. Plus, uh, just for cons just for uh, discussion's sake, our, our departments are asking me for all kinds of positions this year. Um, and, and, and we don't, we're, we're not expecting that that's gonna be possible, especially with, with the revenues that we are anticipating this year. Um, and so that's another consideration is, um, even with our, our funds at 100%, um, maybe they should actually be at 115 or 120 to actually get us to where our departments would like to be at in terms of staffing levels and, um, and other things. So um, there's a, I mean, there's, it's, yeah. a big, it's a big discussion. It's big, yeah. Well, I mean, it really helps me because, I mean, the, in the grander scheme of things, you wanna be able to have enough funds to, to handle your operating expenses but obviously the reserve is, is the capacity that it allows for other things like some of these, uh, you know, the emergency funds, um, you know, and that's outside of the state realm, right? So I get it, some of the funds come from the state and they, go di they get directed to different departments. They're allocated specifically for that. That's, that's separate. Because ultimately whatever the state does is out of our control. Um, I'm speaking specifically is how can we manage this collateral damage that I foresee with our community? That, that's kind of the bigger question. Yeah. Well, you know, hey, being here for a long time, um, I, I know we've uh, talked about reserve policies in previous uh, budget cycles, and we, I, I think one of our budget policies was 15% of the uh, operating budget in, in, a, in a reserve, unrestricted reserve, or is, I, I, I believe, and, and that's there, and it's been there, one of the attractions to PARS was the, the th putting in that three million, and that was a serve as our, as a rainy day fund uh, if, if need be, or a fund that we could draw from to uh, maintain our OPEB uh, liability. That's why that was done. The, uh, I think it was just a couple of years ago that we did the emergency disaster res reserve mm -hmm. and, and called that separate. And I'm, I'm happy Supervisor uh, Medina brought up the fact of the uh, reserve enter enterprise fund, the reserve there. And I, I find that to be a little bit of a lower level than what maybe I would like to see it. But as a board, we have another crisis that we've been working on before COVID-19 be, uh, became the end thing. 
and that was the roads. Yeah. And, and uh, it still is a crisis, and, and so there's a, you know, those projects need to be done that, that you know, McCoskey, and if that's the direction we want, want the uh, haul trucks to go down, and, and Fairview needs to be a, a good road, and, and we can't lose sight of, you know, what we gotta spend money on. And, and not to, you know, uh, forget, we gotta take care of our employees. Uh, we did a compensation study, and so, you know, I, I, I support uh, a general fund reserve policy, you know, call it what, whatever we want to call it, economic uncertainty reserve. I, I think anytime you draw it from your reserve, it's because of uh, something that, that has happened. And this year or next year, we may have to draw from the reserve and not hold it as high of a reserve as we'd like to see. And then a few years down the road, when things kind of turn the other way, we or we improve rev you know revenue streams for this county like uh commercial development which people uh have to realize that the only way we are able to provide services is having revenue and uh we got some you know projects in in the works and even though there's some people that want to kill everything in this county but i believe we'll have uh additional uh, revenue streams as well um, but I I think we have to kind of do what you're talking about Stuart get a general fund reserve policy that uh, helps us uh, access you know funding other additional funding and uh, but we got all this other stuff that needs to be taken care of too Supervisor Medina you good? Okay, um, just just real quickly. So we're using a lot of acronyms: GFOA, Government Finance, Government Officers, Finance Association. Officers Association. Great. Um, and I think the general general practice is what 15 or 16 percent. And I think what you're trying to do here is call out the uh, specific areas because we're at 25 percent. We've always had a uh, a very conservative approach to government finance, which I sincerely appreciate. And the history of you guys doing that has put us in a good position to get through uh, these crises. We we likely depending on how this all, all goes we're going to likely need to use some of that reserve right so we need to just be careful about the policy not setting the policy uh, so high that we're not able to use some of that reserve or if we do we have to have a way to, to be able to be flexible with it and then also um, keep in mind that we uh, as everybody up here mentioned we have a, a ton of uh, road projects and as those road projects are deferred um, the cost becomes more and more and more expensive and that's what we're dealing with now the history of neglect because of lack of funding and now we have the measure g funding we're working on all that stuff so i, I wanted to just thank you for that and um you uh, actually all the supervisors have answered my questions there so thank you and if you want to continue on sure um and then again uh the enterprise policy that uh supervisor medina had alluded to uh uh we, we, we're coming up with with a policy for that as well uh, of, to safeguard some of that funds. Uh, Supervisor Botella, I know, I know you mentioned that that might be a little low, but uh, obviously that is up to the board, to your board to, to make that th those decisions. Um, but this is just kind of an uh, initial recommendation that we kind of started to come up with. Um, I, I know uh, th this might, be low but this was to allow the usage of the allocated uh roads uh road fund balance that was already allocated by the board um but uh so that 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 concludes um, um my presentation uh for today there's going to be a lot more um that we are going to be bringing up at the next uh special uh budget meeting uh which would be june 15th we're hoping to have um, the budget, uh, recommended budget prepared and ready and do some so, uh, some uh, hands-on uh, training on the OpenGov portal uh, so that the board can, uh, can review the budget in there. Um, and then uh, we will move to uh, uh, move the process along. Again, August will be uh, the budget hearings um, and then the final adopt would be uh, September after we've made the corrections, uh, uh, any corrections that have come out of that, so. Stuart, on the OpenGov, um, when, when does that become live, even with a draft budget, for people to be able to scrutinize and look at and ask us questions? Is that going to be before the June meeting or after, or what, what's your? So, 
Uh, it's probably going to be live June 15th. Uh, the recommended budget will be brought to the board at that point. Uh, again, uh, just wanted to make sure that the board email me, call me if there's a specific, uh, you know, budget unit that you want to talk about before uh, that meeting. Um, I'm, I'm all ears. Any members from the public are, are more than welcome to contact the administration office if they have any questions. But um, the recommended budget, we're going to be preparing that internally through the administration um, and presenting that to the board at that time. Um, any changes or, uh, or adjustments the board is, is able to uh, uh, make um, and, the, and the board has full authority to uh, disregard our recommended budget if, if they so choose. Um, but that's, a, that's the time that we're going to be looking to, to work on it. Um, and then that would give the uh, public uh, about two months before public hearings to access the budget um, before, uh, and then they can come in and comment. Um, the board can make adjustments and changes during the pu public hearings as well. Department heads can come and make their case for their budgets as well at that point in time. Um, so it should be available about two months before we finalize the full budget for the next year. I know this is a little different than years prior, but we got behind just basically due to the COVID uh, response. So um, hopefully this will be a little different next year moving forward. Um, okay. And, and this is the first year, I believe that we're gonna have the full implementation of the open gov. And uh, honestly, um, you know, if the community is not aware of that, I'm kind of more speaking to folks that aren't aware of the open gov process. It's a, uh, a um, program that we invested in and uh, based on staff's recommendation last year. Um, got approved and uh, it's going to be a, a way for you to scrutinize your budget whether you're in a CSA whether you're concerned about employee benefits whether you're concerned about road work it's it's an easy easier way for our community to access and get involved with um, our budget and then also provide your elected officials or county administration um, feedback and then just one uh, quick thing that I'm going to mention because I mentioned it um, three or four times during our budget process and uh, Sheriff, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I uh, support you guys 100% with the uh, search and rescue. And if there's not any grant funding, whatever we can do to get you the, the minimum equipment that you feel that you need for your department. Um, I think several supervisors have mentioned that in the past. So if, if that's something that um, you guys are interested in tackling this year, I'm interested in um, working on it with you. Supervisor Patel. Yeah, I had a quick question. I, uh, are, are we still working on some sort of bonding program for for road uh, maintenance, uh, kind of putting together a list of, uh, of road projects and servicing the cost of it through a bonding process, uh, utilizing probably maybe some enterprise funds or ongoing uh, revenue uh, from Measure G? Yeah, hey. um, so uh, I, I know one, one of the main things was looking at the Measure G funding. Um, we, I think COG is still working um, the details out um, in terms of providing money to the locals. Um, I don't think any, everything has been finalized with yeah. that. Um, we would need to look at some bonding uh, depending on how fast these projects can be moved forward. Um, but at this point for next year, um, if we do get the local fund portion that we were supposed to get this last year, it would be enough to cover the initial portion of this. Um, I, in, internally, we have kind of discussed, is it prudent to go for a bond for this or can we use internal monies to, to meet that, that gap at this point in time, especially because uh, I believe they've been collecting this lap, they started this last year, we have at least a full year of collection. So that should be closer to $2 million for the local portion. Uh, then you have all of the current 1920 year. Um, so we've been having that internal discussion, but um, I'm not sure if the- uh, They were supposed to hire some sort of co a consultant to kind of evaluate, you know, the projects that the cities and, and I think the county ha has and, and take the revenues uh, and see whether it's prudent to move forward with the with the bond um, or just go come as you go I it, it's just I, I kind of lost track of where where we're at with, with that Peter's uh, on Roger Hernandez with with uh, what bond well with, uh, we were supposed to hire uh, well not supposed to hire we went out to RFP 
for uh, uh, a firm, uh, a Van Air, so to speak, and they were supposed to coordinate with uh, KLM to, uh, you know, see how we're move forward these road projects and uh, possibly even bond them. So let's do a number of roads all at one time rather than piecemeal it over the next 30 years and then you're, you never get nothing fixed. If it's $2 million, it doesn't get you anywhere. Mr. Chair, um, I may. Oh, yeah. I just I'm had some from, uh, yeah, some quick there. comments. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm at one point in time, I was all for it. Right now, I'm really concerned. I mean, because I think we're coming up to a budgetary cycle and there's going to be a lot of questions the way we handle funding. Uh, I personally don't feel like it's expedient right now to have that conversation. Um, that's What's going on at the COG level? Yeah. Yeah. Huh? What you, what, what, uh, excuse me, let me turn on my mic here. What's going on at the COG level? What, what's your discussion? So when I left COG, the thought was, um, Highway 25 is is you know down the road a little bit you know we're in the planning phase and all that stuff so the thought was maybe for the first five to seven years the money will go to the locals and with the locals having certainty of five to seven years they could do a, a small bond you know whether it be 10 15 million dollars whatever the big project is so the, the cities could get their projects done but uh, that, that was what, what their discussion was Sorry. left at the beginning of January. And I, we haven't had an update on COG in quite some time. I so maybe you can give us an update of where we're at and what's going on with that. I apologize. Yeah, That's so, okay. so it was uh, completely separate. Sorry, I took your words out of context, Supervisor Botello. I thought you were mentioning is, is the local roads, because I know we use the Measure G Quick Fund, but I know that there's a lot more roads. So I thought you were referencing that. Yeah, the, the as far as COG goes, I mean, right now, actually, we're supposed to have a mobility partnership meeting and, and there is a focus on expediting that process. So, so if, it, if that's the context, then it's, that's different. Um, and, and with that, right now, I guess uh, the mayor had mentioned, or you know, as, as one of the members, that uh, the engineers ha had come up with a plan to, to try to expedite this process. It might be still a year past what the, the Caltrans offer was, which was to try to ultimately build that roundabout. But I think if we can present a plan, and it sounds like we're, we're looking at that, uh, even probably, uh, I know Cog's talking about getting a lobbyist to help push for funding sooner, but but maybe a bond would be adequate because yeah, that's that's specific to the Measure G bond already. So I, I get, so that makes more sense what you were mentioning. It just kind of was out of, out of out of uh, I, it didn't make sense to me when you were mentioning what you were mentioning. Yeah. But nonetheless, yeah, that that's kind of where we're at, and it looks like there's a lot of momentum. This the definitely especially with this situation. Uh, yeah, the, the northern counties need help. They want help, and they want us to to try to minimize the cost. Because I know the longer we take, the more expensive it's going to get. Yeah, I, I, I not not mean to put you on the spot, uh, Supervisor Hernandez. Uh, you know, it's uh, you're brand mind. new on I'm used on to that it. on that committee, <laughs> and there's it, it's it's a very complex deal. There's three uh, different components to it. Yes. Yeah, yeah but yeah, maybe perhaps. Oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, yeah, perhaps we could get a report from yeah. uh, Cog uh, 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 as an update as yeah. far as where their status is with. Uh, yeah. That's ultimately what I was going to suggest, is let's is get an update from COG. I know um, our RMA director, Harry Mavagenis, is on the phone. He probably can comment on a couple of matters, a couple items on this. One of the things that I will say from our side is that we have been um, definitely keen prior to COVID and working very diligently with that. Actually, these policies right now before you today, the discussion of them, the draft policies, are really critical for us to continue to receive high rating, bond ratings. Um, we received the double A, um, and which is exceptional, um, especially for our small county. Um, and really our rate was in the two range to 2.49. Is that what the final rate was? Uh, amazing rate. Um, um, so, you know, I think to just elaborate a little bit more, I think this is, you know, if we have the funds or we, we have the means to um, make payments on that, um, I think it'd be advantageous to do that, uh, especially if the rates are really, really low or even lower than that. Um, but with that, um, I, I do know Harry's been um, also very in tune with what's happening. Harry, do you have any comments on that? Oh, you gotta mute yourself. Director, if you can unmute yourself perhaps um, on your devices. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Great. Uh, the COG, uh, they have not uh, finalized their financing plan. They're still looking at it, uh, particularly with regard to the 
situation with COVID, which has reduced the potential tax revenues. So uh, we're expecting something from COG uh, in the next month or so. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we know that the first five years, uh, there is a local share. The funds are split in a way where the cities and the county gets uh, a certain amount of money we anticipate it'd be close to 2 million a year, 1.7 to 2 million, uh, that would be able to go towards local roads. Uh, beyond the fifth year, there has not been a decision yet on whether the COG will want more of that money towards the Highway 25 project. As you all know, the, uh, the project that Caltrans has designed is far more expensive than the, uh, the COG can afford and we're looking at options. In fact, at the end of the month, there'll be a second set of meetings with Caltrans to see if there are any more reasonable cost options, uh, including four-laning the existing highway that might work better uh, than uh, trying to go to the, uh, the Caltrans project, which is almost 300 million. But uh, we will keep the board posted. Uh, after this set of meetings this month, uh, through the uh, administration, we can prepare a report to update the board here. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Any questions from the board? Do we have any public comment on this item? Stuart, you're done with your presentation, correct? Any public comment? Maria, if you could please state your name for the record. You try one more time, Madam Clerk. Maria. Maria, if you're there, can you uh, unmute your device and go ahead and speak? Okay, Any, anybody else in line, we can try and come back to Maria. Mecca, if you could please state your name. Mecca. Mecca or Maria, either, either or. Mecca is here. Go right ahead, Mecca, we can hear you fine. Hi, I'm Mecca Nix, Cradled Critters Pet Sitting Services, local business owner in San Benito County. I just wanna say I agree with Cuneo and Hurtado and many others that have voiced their opinions to reopen our county. I, for one, am completely offended at the very idea that anyone would call my business or anyone else's for that matter, non-essential. Absolutely no one has the right to make such a draconian declaration that is the language of dictators and should not even be given the privilege of acknowledgement by a free people. A free society does not ask for permission on how to provide for their families. My freedom does not stop anyone, uh, the right of anyone to quarantine to protect themselves or their families as they see fit. But demanding I do the same does stomp on my rights. The COVID statistics in our county do not in any way show any justification for this continued shutdown. Open San Benito County now. Sue the state if we have to. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anybody else have comments on this specific item? Looks like I'm getting a head shake of no. Any other comments on the specific item of the uh, budget process? We'll, wait, we'll just wait a couple moments and make sure, and then I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, I have a future agenda item that I'd like to mention, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Yeah, so, well, actually, if, if, if the board could oblige, I mean, two things. One is, you know, with some of the stuff that I'd mentioned earlier, um, um, I, I think it's expedient for us to, to uh, I know that there's a day called Constitution Day. I think it's September 17th. It would be good for us as a board to uh, not only uh, uh, uphold it, but as we as we've done with our oath, but ultimately, maybe even have an agenda uh, item that, that actually emphasizes reading it. Um, it's, it's, it's intended really for us to go through it and un understand the laws that we're under, which is, I think, of everybody's right to address. Uh, but then the second item is specifically to what I mentioned about the governor. Um, I don't know if you wanna make it two separate items, so that would be three, and I'm not trying to get overly redundant, but, but uh, one is, is the, the suit to the state, and then the second would be is for us to basically uh, a resolution that would uh, pretty much just uh, we, we would violate or not support the state order. Um, 
you know, at the end of the day, I feel like we, we just need to basically address that we're, we're not, I personally don't agree with, with a state order and we, we need to move forward with supporting that in my mind. We can't, we can't hold our community hostage any longer. Those are my comments. Okay, um, I, I think you should work with the chair on the uh, constitution item and I don't see a, um, I'm looking at the fellow board members for the second item that you mentioned for a, a consensus to add that to the agenda, was whether or not we're gonna sue the state and willingly violate the orders and suffer the consequences of that. And I don't see the, the, that here. I don't see any support for that. And I'm looking at all the supervisors and uh, if that's something you wanna address with the chair when he returns, I think you should. And with that, I'll uh, adjoin a uh, motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Approved. Go. I think. Uh, oh, we got a. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is this a public comment regarding um, the item? Okay. Go. Go ahead. We'll. We'll. We'll go ahead and handle it. We're, we're going to deal with the technology issues because of Zoom. Definitely. Yep. Jackie, if you could please state your name. Yes. Um, good morning. This is Jackie Morris. Lopez. Jackie, Once is this again, a comment regarding the, the specific item? Because you made a comment on, on COVID already. I, I did. This is, okay. this is regarding the budget. Okay, go um, right ahead. Thank you thank for you. sharing the budget. Um, it looks like things are um, in line. I appreciate knowing where the money's going. I look forward to the public hearing on the budget. I have a question for Supervisor Hernandez. He can answer or not answer. Um, you said that you want to defy the governor, governor's orders, and this has to tie in with the budget, the item that we just discussed or that I just heard. Um, are you willing to turn over the California COVID funding back to the governor if you're in defiance of his orders? Thank you. Thank you. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. So moved, so move, second. Supervisor Patello and Hernandez, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Sporo. Meeting's adjourned.